Hello, everybody. This is the Retro Bear. It's Saturday morning. It's incredibly early if you are up listening to this when it goes out. Uh, if not, then it's probably a much more convenient time of day for you. But it's another episode of Desert Island Games, the interview program which is taking the internet by storm. Those are my own words. And hopefully one day that will actually be true. Uh, this is, if you've not heard Desert Island Games before, the show where I invite a YouTuber uh, on to talk about their gaming history uh, and in the concept of the traditional uh, and aged old radio program, Desert Island Discs, rather than asking them to bring records, I ask them to bring games. Six games of their choice, which their favourites, or they will get most use of if they were stuck on a desert island. And also two other games on top of that. One game, which is a second chance game. Perhaps they've not had the opportunity to play it properly or or didn't get very far with it, or wanted to give it a second go. And just to make life a bit more difficult, if it wasn't difficult enough living, living on a desert island, um, a game that they don't particularly like, for whatever reason, which they will explain in due course. Interspersed with that list, we talk about their gaming history, how they've got to where they are, what consoles they've owned, what systems they played on, where their first experiences were, and we also talk a little bit about their YouTube journey. Now, this week, um, I'm very pleased to say another YouTuber that I've met in person, an absolute smashing lad, lovely company, um, relatively new to YouTube as well, which is good, because we always like to welcome newcomers on board. Um, and as always, I will put a link to his channel in the description below. But here, for his Desert Island Games, I'm very pleased to welcome Daily Retro, a.k.a. Dale, and very warm welcome to you, sir. Hi, Russ. Hello, listeners. Great to be on the show. Absolutely love listening to Desert Island Games. And yeah, I can't wait to be a part of this week's episode. Yep, you're, you're very kind, and um, thank you for reading that out. That was that was great. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's great to have you on, because we, we have met in person a couple of times, and um, it, it, it's been fabulous to meet you. And, and uh, I, I love I love your your channel, very, very down-to-earth. And uh, another tuber as well who, who incorporates, he's, he's, we always say, better half on this programme. As part of, of what you do as well, and uh, that, that regular viewers to your channel will know that, that uh, Natasha is expecting at the moment. So, um, um, it's an interesting yeah. time, isn't it? We thought we'd better get this recorded quickly before it became too late. Yeah, six weeks to go, so we better be quick about it. <laughs> six weeks, oh my goodness me, the excitement! I told you before, I told, we tried to chat before, and I, I said, You do realize once those six weeks have happened and, it, and she gives birth then you're going to be so busy running around after her and, and the little and tidying things up and all sorts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, but it's all about, I'm all about it and I've uh, been looking forward to it for a long while now, so mm. can't wait to, and, uh, can't wait to little, uh, meet, meet the little man. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you've been really looking forward to it, so it's, it's absolutely fantastic and uh, we all wish you the very best for it and um, um, I'm sure you'll, you'll let us know when, when the happy event happens. This, but it's, it's great to have you on, and um, I hope this is going to be a, an interesting, fascinating insight into your gaming history. Some games on your list, which I always get from you beforehand, that we haven't had before. A couple we've had recently, um, but interesting. Well, a little bit of a mix of, of, of sort of a real couple of real classics and some real modern stuff as well, uh, which is always nice. Mixed with systems as well, which is good. Um, so this is going to be a fasc fascinating story, but we always start this off. Anybody who's not familiar with your channel, Dale, um, give us a, a quick oversight to how you start YouTube and the sort of things that you do on your channel. So I'm very much a techie. Um, that's my whole career is IT, and um, obviously up until recently we didn't have our own house to sort of. I think for a games room, for most people, you need to have dedicated room or at least a dedicated half a room or something yeah um, and you can't really do that when you're in rental properties um so i've been planning to sort of have a games room and therefore a youtube channel on top of that for quite a while but it's only come to fruition from march when we uh, moved into our first home um and yeah the games room has really evolved in that short space of time that's only March this year. So I started the YouTube channel in April. Um, it was sort of a very nervous start. <laughs> I am quite sort of an introverted guy. Um, I sort of, I, I can I can talk, but it sort of drains my mental battery. But I think right. YouTube is a good way to sort of 
make yourself more confident in those sorts of situations. And I agree. Watch, yeah. watching back my old videos, even from well, only April, it, it already seems like I'm getting more and more confident. Um, not to sound big headed or anything, but <laughs> well, no, I, I think as time goes on, we all improve. If, if it, I, I watch my old videos just for, for curiosity, and yeah. I like to think that I've improved. I know, I know, I have improved. Um, and everybody says the same thing. You, you watch your early stuff; it's it's terrible. But you've got to start. Le- if it's not what you do as part of your everyday life, talking to a camera or somebody, it's it's a bit a bit tricky. Uh, well, Goodwin's place when he was on a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that um, you know, he does that for a job, and yeah. it, it's as nerve wracking for him to do that as it is to sit in front of a YouTube camera as well. So, but you, a lot of people have said this helps, as you said. So it's all good really at the end of the day yeah and um having the games room especially was also like a a sort of mini dream of mine i've i've always wanted a place to sort of display everything it was kind of sad when i um had it all in boxes and never played with Mm. Um, so yeah it's nice to have everything all out and uh, as i said because i work in it I, i try and make the experience of the games room as seamless as possible and um, been trying to sort of um, incorporate that into my YouTube videos. So I find a lot of the positive feedback I get on my channel is mostly about my games room setup. Mm. Um, So there's a couple of videos, uh, for example, where I'm talking about how I've got all of my consoles hooked into one HDMI port. Yeah. Um, so I never, I I never have to unplug cables or anything um, because it's all seamless. I've got a, uh, a two times eight way sort of power block at the bottom of my games Kallax unit, and so that it saves the capacitors in them. I only turn them on when I'm about to play them. Mm-hmm. So literally, all I have to do to play a console is turn my TV turn on the power for it and you're away sort of thing right, yeah yeah you've got that fantastic racing rig as well haven't you which is uh <laughs> absolutely love that that video it, it's yeah. that good you, ha- you have to wear driving gloves don't you <laughs> yeah so that was quite quite a recent upgrade it was i had a cheap well, i say cheap you can you can start sort of sim racing on a logitech wheel for about 400 pounds so I think the actual Logitech wheel, the G29 for the PlayStation version, it's mm-hmm. called, is about £200 with the, with the pedals. Um, and you can buy a manual shifter if you want as well for about 20 quid. Um, and then there's something called a play seat. Play seat had a play seat evolution, which was sort of my intro into it, which is about £200 again. So you can all so you can mount it to it. Mm-hmm. and you get that sort of rigidity and it feels more like you're driving a, a real car. Um, and my, my love of sim racing is mainly down to my love of rally. Yeah. So I'm really into rally outside of gaming, um, watch the WRC all the time. Um, which is really exciting at the moment because uh, a Welshman Elvin Evans is almost, he almost won the championship last year and he's second in this year's one as well. Oh, okay. So that sort of motivates me to become a better sort of esports rally driver. I, I've, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a pro. I would say I'm sort of an intermediate level. Um, I've won local motor club esports rally championships um, before, and that's just sort of in the area of Gloucester, Gloucestershire, Worcestershire, and Bristol sort of areas. Wow, that's fantastic. But that was only out of about 30 people. Mm. And I would only sort of consider one of them like on my level where he's got um, a similar sort of setup to what I've upgraded to now, which is a full um, Fanatec um, rig. And instead of the £400 total of the last (laughs) rig, this is about 10 times as much. Wow. So So we're talking thousands in here. 
Wow. I, I waited. I waited till after we'd bought the house, so it was sort of like <laughs> how much money am I got left over? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big layout for something like that, but I can see yeah. why. If you, if you are racing at that level, you yeah, need I mean, something I was, like that. Yeah, I was on the cusp of like winning like, these local championships on the cheap gear. And um, the guy who kept winning, I was always talking to him about it. I was like, how, how, how much of an upgrade is this better, better hardware? And he was like, it's night and day, mate. You've got to go for it if you've got the money. Mm. Uh, and it's not going to bankrupt you just do it because it will last longer um it'll keep its value so these these pits of fanatec kit they if anything they appreciate in value because they usually sell out um so my kit my main bit of kit is uh, fanatec dd1 it's called which is stands for direct drive right so instead of a um Instead of like a, a clicky motor inside in Logitech, which you can sort of feel the notches as you turn the wheel, you've got um, something called an outrunner motor. So you literally don't feel the motor spinning round and it doesn't have a physical limit as to how far you can turn the wheel. Mm. Um, obviously, you can set how far you want to turn the wheel, <laughs> <It> depends <laughs> on what, what game you're playing. But... The technology inside it is incredibly reliable and powerful. Um, the main bit of sort of the, the reason it's expensive is because of the amount of newton meters of torque it can output. So a Logitech G29 can output about two newton meters of torque, and this one can output twenty. So that's, that's it's, not great, isn't it? Yeah, it's if you put it on full twenty, it's like. If you've ever driven a car without power steering, it's like that. I um, I, I never have done, but I know, I know my other half did, and yeah. she absolutely hated it. <laughs> so yeah. I, th I think she went, from, she went from a car without with power steering to one without. And I remember the one time we were trying to do a three point turn in the road; and it was just it was just physically impossible to do it with a, a car like that. Yeah, so it's 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 a workout to say the least. Um, it does actually say have warnings all over it, saying do not exceed playtime of more than twenty minutes at a time without a break. Mm. Um, I generally play on fifty percent, which is still ten newton meters, which is still five times more than I used to have. But I find that sort of the sweet spot between <laughs> not breaking myself and <laughs> still having some nice sort of feeling through the wheel, because that's yeah. that's the only way you get feeling is through the wheel you're not you've not got i mean i've got um a, a motor in the ped brake pedals that vibrates when you get to 100 percent braking but apart from that you you're not getting the motion like you are in a real car it's all through the wheel the feedback um so that's why it's important to have good feedback and mm. i should probably mention to the viewers um that it's that's all currently done mostly on dirt rally 2.0 by codemasters Right, um, and the original Dirt Rally is on my list for a little bit later on. <laughs> oh right, okay, a bit, a bit of a spoiler there for anybody who's listening. But I tell you something: there's a lot of us. I mean, I, I like my racing games. I, I yeah. nothing I, I love better than putting a racing game on. I know quite a few people do that as well. I tell you something: this is a completely different level to that. And wow, that is that is really impressive. That is yeah. that is the, uh, there's something else. The realism through sort of modern consoles has come a long way in the past sort of 10 years, I'd say. Um, I first had an experience on like a PlayStation 3 steering wheel probably almost 10 years ago. Mm. Um, and for, I think that was on Dirt 3 on PS3. Okay. Um, and that was a more arcade style game. So instead of serious rally it was more like just drive around this circuit in the best time you can um and pull off these stunts and stuff um mm. which I, I still enjoyed um especially the rally cross parts because as well as liking my rally I also like rally cross which is basically just the circuit racing basically with rally cars mm. um and those are all in dirt games so any dirt game you play you've got rally cross and it, yeah, it's epic playing playing those if you've never experienced them. Um, 
it obviously depends which version of dirty play as to how sort of realistic they are. Mm. Um, I would say the more modern ones, especially Dirt Rally, are, have got a higher level of realism than, say, the first three games on PlayStation 3. Okay. I remember playing... Um, I've got somewhere... I'm, I think I've still got it somewhere. I've got, I've got a Logitech racing wheel, which had the force feedback on it. Cause we, we played Grid on PlayStation 3. Yeah. Um, that was that was a, a real experience. That was a, driving with the wheel. It was really quite intense so i can only imagine what this is like but this is this yeah brilliant setup man. absolutely fantastic nice you had some money left over from when you bought the house as well to do but... <laughs> yeah yeah just gotta save the rest for the garden because it didn't come with a garden basically so <laughs> 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 well well there we go there we go but yeah you, you've got to keep us updated on how you're getting on with that then because you know in terms of your your e-sports, I say career or, or ventures, because the um, yeah, first, have... person, first person I've spoken to who been doing anything like that. So. Yeah, I have thought about putting it on my channel, but then I'm sort of at, at the, of the mindset that I am mostly focusing my content on obviously retro <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And um, it doesn't really fit in with that. And it's quite niche rally driving. I mean, you don't hear many people who sort of, take rally esports very seriously it's i'd say the more the esports is more sort of aimed at games like formula one and gran yeah. turismo and things like that but there may be, may be people out there who'd enjoy that that's a great um value of youtube is you're never quite sure what's going to be what's going to work and what isn't going to work you know you, you could you could be sitting there thinking oh people will not be interested in that and if you put a video out you might get you know hundreds and hundreds of views on it and you go oh that's, yeah. that's quite surprising Best, the best way to do is put it out there, set yourself, you know, okay, what would I like that video to do? 100 yeah. views, 200 views. Be reasonable about it. If you get over that, you're happy with it. And you're, okay, maybe there is a market yeah. for this. So, But yeah. we'd like to see yeah. something like that. I know, I know there's that one video you've done where you've, you were showing off the one wheel and, um, yeah. Yeah, I would like it. to do a video on it at some point in depth um, and give people sort of a demo of how it works. Um, because I, I could talk for hours about it, but I don't want to bore everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you've got your own channel to talk for it about hours on there. So yeah, so that's it, but yeah, I, 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 so I always put a link to the channel below. What I'm going to do, probably, I'll put a link to that video. That, that I think that was sure. you did, um, because I think that will give people an example of what we're talking about. If they're not quite sure or they want to see it in action for themselves, so I'll do, I usually put the latest video on there, but I think in this case, because you've talked so passionately and in depth about it that people will be interested to see what it is and say oh, I wonder what that's all about well that video will be put, we'll put that one in there below for you so people can have a look at that for you all right yeah that'd be great yeah no problem at all so yeah that all will be sorted out at the end now we get on with the, we, we get on with the, the the meat of the the show this week yeah we just talked about you you and games and all sorts of things and how we got there and whatever um we had a, obviously always have a quick chat before, and so first of all, I know what I'm talking about, and secondly, you know what we're going to do, so I don't put any surprises on you. Um, your gaming history, the, 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 your journey starts started off quite interestingly uh, from what, what you told me beforehand, and again, completely different to anybody I've had on before. So, fill us in as, as to how you 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 picked up this this uh, interest, this wonderful hobby that we have. Yeah, so. I was born in 93, which obviously is, uh, so makes me a bit younger no, than a lot of you. Your... <laughs> I was 18 in 1993, you young person, you. <laughs> yeah, I might be the youngest person you've ever had on Desert Island Games. But... You maybe, yeah, you probably will be, actually. Most of us, uh, most people in their 30s, there's a few of us over 40, and, 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 and you know, a few of us over 50 as well. So, but yeah, definitely the youngest one we've had on. But yeah, um, so my my dad was a techie as well. He moved out to Cyprus for work with my mum in ninety one or ninety two, I think. Mm. Um, he sort of did satellite engineering, um, and while he was out there, he sort of discovered it was a good time to have a baby because his work would like basically pay everything. Um, <laughs> but Cyprus. Where, where he moved to, um, it was an area called um, 
Ias Nicolaias um, is they sort of they're sort of ten years behind the rest of the world, I would say. <laughs> um, so while whilst everyone was sort of enjoying the PlayStation in the late nineties, I was still in Cyprus, obviously, and you'd go to a pub and there would still be arcade machines mm -hmm. and um so i have fond memories of um especially gallagher on a cocktail table which is the first game on my list mm -hmm. um but also the stand-up pac-man um cabs yep um, i think that was just in a random restaurant out there and my parents would sort of give me 20p and say go play for a bit sort of thing <laughs> um but but the first game on my list um to start start my list off is Gallagher on the cocktail table. Yeah. So my parents' favourite bar, I didn't I didn't know this at the time, but apparently Cyprus in the nineties there was no drink driving laws. So <laughs> I really I, oh, okay, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hate him to think how many, yeah, I hate him to think how many times they went took me out to the pub and let me play on this Gallagher kind of like cocktail table and then drove home drunk, but well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Could have ended up completely differently, yeah. It was it was um basically on an RAF base, so there wasn't much traffic anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway, um yeah, Gallagher on the cocktail table was my first sort of gaming memory. It's mm. not it's not a game I fell in fell in love with straight away um because it is it is a hard game especially for a child um and yeah i, I just have vivid memories of this Gallagher cocktail table being in the middle of a bar and obviously it was being sort of late 90s um people had their beers on top and they would have all these beer marks all over them <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think it. I think it was also like a, a multi cab version that had. Um, I think it was Asteroids as well. But Gallagher was the more fun title because it had the um, two player controls. So you know, and you had one person sitting at one side of the table playing as one player, and the other side of the table was the second player. Um, so I'd sort of play against my um, school friends or my parents' friends who were at the bar as well and. Mm. Really enjoyed that, and um, so yeah, that is that is my first gaming memory. Um, obviously, I've vivid memories as well of Pac-Man, but I can just remember enjoying Gallagher a lot more, mm. um, just because I think I think um, obviously the skill level Pac-Man is I would say a bit higher than Gallagher. So for a, so for a child, a twenty p in Gallagher would last me. I don't know, ten minutes. Whereas in Pac-Man, it might only last you a minute or two. Ten uh, minutes, blimey! That's that's uh, that's going something. That is at that age. <laughs> I, can't, yeah. I, I, think, I think I can get through ten minutes now. <laughs> like when <laughs> I was younger, uh, the reactions were better. Um, I mean, what, what was it? What what was the immediate attraction to to sort of the arcade? Because when you see these things the first time, it, for a lot of people, it, it's a light bulb moment or you know, you sort of think, "Wow, I like this. I want to play more, more of this." What, what was it f for you? Was it was there a particular attachment to it, or? Um, I think it was more the fact that it was the first sort of gaming experience I had, and having that physical joystick to actually move around the screen and the actual big fire buttons to press was sort of an oddly satisfying experience. <laughs> Especially at that age, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you worked out there was a concept to it fairly quickly. It's not just a case of bashing and you, you, you had a, a vague idea of what you're meant yeah. to be doing. Yeah, I think I've always, there. I think I've always had um, a sort of love for computers, but not just computers, but how things work. Basically, I mean, when I was a child, I used to just love taking things apart and. Mm usually breaking them before I put them back together, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, love it, of computers yeah. that sort of followed me for for the rest of rest of my years to be honest. Mm. Did you um 
was your interest in the, your interest in the arcade prolonged after that? Was it just this, this period that started you off and then you were into other things, or did you were you always interested in arcades after that? Cause, I, mean, I mean, around that time, two thousand was probably the last hurrah for arcades. It was <laughs> before yeah, that, it was that moved on and and that era finished. Yeah, so I kind of got like the biggest era jump ever when we moved back to the UK in two thousand. So having gone from something that was designed to be around in the mid eighties or late eighties maybe, mm. to suddenly suddenly seeing PlayStation Ones everywhere and going around school friends' house and they've got a PlayStation One, that was a massive jump. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine. We, 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 I've, talk, I've talked about this with, with somebody else and, and it's the, the jump from generation to generation to generational system to system is, is usually quite noticeable. That probably would have been moving from early 80s technology. We're talking Pac-Man was with 1980, I think it was, and Gallagher's probably around about, if not a little bit later than that, to, to basically early 2000s technology with things running on disc and, you know, yeah, it, it's that, that must have been a, a real sort of like eye-popping moment to see those systems in action. Yeah, it was definitely a quantum leap but mm. I think that that leap has sort of served me well because I now have more respect for how graphics have evolved over the years, especially. Um, because when we got back um, a few months after that, I think I think it was either me or my, or my brother's birthday or possibly Christmas. My brother's birthday is very close to Christmas. Um, I got given... A Mega Drive by my cousin mm. who didn't want it anymore. This is the year 2000. Um, everyone's moving on to N64s and PlayStations. Um, and I think he did actually, my cousin did move on to the N64 from right. the Mega Drive. Um, so we got a hand me down Mega Drive, which I am still very proud to own. You and, still got it. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, had it sat in a box for a lot of years um played it the old time when i really really felt like getting it out sort of thing and yeah still works had it recently sent off to um will's console mods um he's a recommended okay. um modder in kent i think actually no it's uh folkestone the uh fairy port town okay yeah um He's like a recommended modder of all these high high end mods you can buy for consoles. So I thought I'd send him my Mega Drive as well at the same time. And he recapped it all for me and put new power regulators in it. Um, because I noticed the sound was started to go in a bit funny, uh, which is a good telltale sign that the capacitors are starting to go. Mm. Um, if you don't do something soon, then it's going to be unplayable. Um, and when I got it back, it was honestly one of the best moments because <laughs> you plug it in and it's like oh my god this is like when i played it new <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost fresh out of the box then yeah literally. Um, what what was your because what was your impression of the mega drive when you first saw it because i know you said there was you saw people playing playstation be given a mega drive at the same time it's still it's a step up from playing gallagher and pac-man in the arcade but it's still a step down from or two steps down from when people playing playstations yeah, I mean, it was kind of nice for me because I, I got, again, a little step up instead of a big jump up. Um, I think I think I'll actually pass this on to my son, to be honest. I'll be like, well, if you want to play this next system, you've got to complete a game on this other system first. And that's what people um, do. That's what people yeah. do. Um, I think it was quite nice to go from arcade to um, 16-bit Um and I never really felt like I was losing out as such um, because, well, A, I was playing on PlayStation 1s at my friend's house. Mm. And then B, I would actually, they, it, it would end up being that they wanted to come over to my house to play the Mega Drive because the Mega Drive has some amazing multiplayer games. Um, yep. One of which we'll come on to talk, to we'll, about, talk about in a minute. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that one shortly, yeah. Yeah, so um, that that was quite a nice transition for me, I think. Um, and having both of those areas sort of readily available because my best friend lived very close by was 
actually really cool because I could um, sort of gain gain knowledge of how to play both eras of system and sort of gain an appreciation for again how far the technology has come mm. which i think is invaluable really when it's obviously quite sad nowadays that kids just don't know how far technology has come um they might have started on say playstation 4 recently and then they, they just think that's the norm but mm. Um, from a computing point of view with, I can't remember whose theory it is, but the theory of um, CPUs being able to sort of double their capacity every couple of years, um, with that theory incorporated into games consoles, you sort of really get a, a feeling of how, how this technology is evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really spurred my, uh, passion for retro gaming over the years. Yeah. What what about games uh, sort of system before that? Did you play? Did you have much exposure or experience with the the eight bit micros at the time, or that come later, or have you never got into that area? Um, so it's only been a recent thing, really. So when I got the analog Mega SG, which is basically a modern remake of the Mega Drive that outputs to HDMI and upscales, upscales it. Um, it comes with a master system adapter. Mm -hmm. And this is only in the last two or three years, um, I discovered that obviously master system has a lot of arcade style titles that the Mega Drive doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, like R-Type, for example, which yep. is a game that I remember playing on an arcade at some point, but couldn't sort of pinpoint it. And then was able to get that exposure fairly recently, but <laughs> yeah, but I never had exposure to sort of the Commodore or the Master System mm -hmm. before before the Mega Drive. Unfortunately, um, my my dad was also quite passionate. Um, he was also a techie as well as self. Um, he had a Commodore sixty four. Yeah. Um, so he talked to me about that and. Um, I think he had a ZX Spectrum as well, which he still has in the loft somewhere. We just haven't found it yet, which is unfortunate. Oh, no, dig that if you can find it, yeah. Yeah. But um, his his favourite game, game from his childhood that I actually enjoy playing now is a game called Digger by Windmill Software. Um, I did actually put a video out a few months back on that. You so did. that yeah. that game was released in 1983, I think, on the IBM PC, and um, it's actually got a high sort of high, well, yeah, high graphical, high, highly graphical game for its era. Um, it's sort of like a Pac-Man clone, um, but he had a lot of nostalgia for that game, and sort of passed on his love for that game to me. Um, and I, I've now got it on, obviously we well, just can't see this, but I've got um, a tabletop arcade just with a Raspberry Pi in that's got um, emulators on mm -hmm. and uh, can run MS-DOS version of Digger. Um, oh, yeah, of course, that was in the video as well, wasn't it? So. Yeah, yeah. so um, really, really pleased that I can sort of go back and experience these games that my dad talked about from his childhood. Mm -hmm. Um when when we can, we do actually try and go to um, sort of play expos and things like that together. Because um, even though he wasn't, he's not as big a gamer as me. He does have still that nostalgia for things like the ZX Spectrum and the IBM PC. And uh, myself and my brother found it absolutely hilarious when we went <laughs> to New York. We went to uh, I think mean, there's a computing museum somewhere in New York. It might just be part of. Oh, no, that's what it was. Sorry, it was in the, the Washington um, Museum, whatever it's called. Oh, Smithsonian. Um, yeah, Smithsonian. Yeah. So he saw the, all these oh. PCs that he used to work on in the 80s in the, in the museum, and we were just laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to go around that. I, I, I don't think I want to leave the amount of stuff and exhibits they have in that place. Um, yeah. It's it, like, it, oh, I used to fix that. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> not I anymore. It's not, but it's not like when I walk around the um, the video game 
um, museum, which used to be in Nottingham, which is now in uh, Sheffield, I think. Is that correct? Um, and I've walked around there, and I, I've, I've seen things they got on display. Saying, "I've got that. I've got that." <laughs> now, I couldn't go. I couldn't go to the Natural History Museum or somewhere else and walk around. You know, an exhibit full of stuffed animals and you know uh, exhibits from the Victorian times. Saying, "I've got one of them at home. I've got one of them. I haven't." It's like walk around and yeah, I've got that console there. I've got that box there. I've got that special. It's it's, it's strange we do something like that. Yes, yeah. uh, very very good. Um, before we, we we move on to to some of your games from your gaming list on the subject of the Mega Drive, apart from what we're going to talk about, any other favourites from that time? Um, so the games I got given with the Mega Drive was the original Sonic, which I still absolutely love, but I thought as it's been talked about quite a lot, and the other game is that that's on my list, so I have more. Mm-hmm sort of love for i thought i wouldn't put it on my list but i do love the original sonic yeah um there's also the football games i enjoyed on the mega drive um as soon as as soon as i played a playstation game on playstation one and two i i didn't like them um mm. i sh- yeah i still go back and play football games on the mega drive because i think they're way better than anything 3D, to be honest. Obviously, you, you get some sort of 3D in the Mega Drive with things like European soccer and FIFA. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you could have the hilarity of run away, running away from the referee on the FIFA, <laughs> oh, you're FIFA, FIFA 98 or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's the thing that you do find with, with modern incarnations of games. And yeah. I find this myself because I'm I'm, I'm not very good at them. But how certain genres evolve to incorporate, as a controller evolves, mm. to incorporate more buttons, therefore you can do more things with them. So when you, I, I agree, I probably would get more enjoyment now out of playing FIFA 95. And I say that one because I had that and used to play it to death. Yeah. As opposed I've... to sort of now, now playing the, 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 the newest FIFA release with all these little tricks and turns and things that you can do. And it's like, yeah. I don't want to do that. I just want to, you know. Yeah, so much more. Them simplicity when you've just got three or six buttons yeah um, and it was usually the three buttons for me if it was more than three i would struggle to learn a sort of complex <laughs> case yeah, there we go and, and you're younger than me and i complain about that so that, that's okay we can we can learn <laughs> with that <laughs> um okay so let's step away from your, your your gaming history so we'll come back to that in a little bit okay um let, let's talk to your, your your desert island games as such. Uh, you've spoken about Galaga. Yep. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that one? I mean, um, is, it, is it a game you play now? Is it a game you dip into now and then? Or Yeah, so I still have a lot of nostalgia for it. Um, that was sort of uh, rejuvenated by Arcade Club and Berry, which we went to a few years ago with... Um, Natasha, who was just a girlfriend at the time, but yeah, we both, <laughs> we both um, really enjoyed Arcade Club in Berry. I think there's now one in Leeds as well. That's right. Yeah. Um, and they had, they had the they had the exact same Gallagher cocktail table in there, so we played against each other, and immediately my love came back for it. And I was like, as much as cocktail tables i feel like they're not as loved obviously as stand-up cabs um as much as they're not as sort of playable um compared to a stand-up cab i absolutely love them that fact that you can sit down put your beer on it have a two-player game with someone who's across from the table from you Mm. um so much so that i then went and made myself a cocktail table which was just an Ikea um, coffee table that was like £11 and modified it and put all these two-player controls in it and an LCD monitor and a Raspberry you, Pi. And you made... made one yourself? Yeah. <laughs> what? Ah, is, there no, is there no end to your talent, Dale? This is, this is, this is, you've, got this giant, you've, got, you've got this racing rig and now you're making arcade cocktail doctor, tab, uh, arcade machines out of like bits and pieces you can find from Ikea. This is brilliant. <laughs> Admittedly, it's not... Um, the controls aren't either side of the table. They're just like together like they would be on a two-player stand-up cabinet. Um, but that is mainly due to the size of the table. It's literally just a <laughs> square that's like, I don't know, maybe 
uh, I think it's about 55 centimeters by 55 centimeters. So it's mm. not, it's not massive. Um, and because of that, I'd sort of condense it all. Um, but I'd like, I, the hardest bit of that project actually, and all the tech stuff I found easy, but the hardest bit of that project was getting the, um, um, instead of glass on the top, which you used to have on the originals, obviously, mm-hmm. and that's that's very expensive to get custom cut or made. Um, I just got some very high quality perspex from a company I found online, and they sort of. I was like, I can cut the buttons, I can cut the holes for the buttons myself with my drill, but I just need a piece of perspex that's exactly the same width and height as the IKEA table. Um, and that proved to be quite tricky because the first bit they sent me was like one centimeter out, and I was like, "It looks crap." Was... <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But that 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 is, that is brilliant. That, that really is. The same thing that when I I played arcades, I as you said, I grew up. Most people grew up with the sort of the, the stand up ones or the the hydraulic ones or the sit down ones, and I I don't think I've ever actually played on a, a tabletop one before. Uh, the, the cocktail cabinet, as you refer to, I think I ever played on one. Yeah, they're certainly un, un, yeah, they're not uh, loved as loved as tabletops. Um, I would eventually like to own an original Gallagher cocktail table, but if you've ever looked up how much they are, you'll know why I, I haven't got one. <laughs> I, I, I haven't, but I'm talking to a man who spent. Fourth, whatever it was, on that. <laughs> yeah, surely, surely, a Gallagher original cocktail arcade is, is not is going to be a mere drop in the ocean. Oh, well, maybe not. I don't know. I think I think it's I think you can get one for about two grand, but it's the it's the whole reliability side of things. That very that, true. That, very true. that four grand thing is going mm. to last ten plus years, no problem, and it's got warranties and such. But if you buy an old cabinet or an old cocktail table in this case um you're gonna have to maintain it there's no warranty if it no. breaks you're gonna have to fix it yourself and as much as i am a techie i wouldn't say i'm electro an electronics expert mm. i can i can solder basic things like um, batteries to carts and test them with my multimeter and stuff like that mm. but doing sort of very tiny capacitor soldering i will I wouldn't say I'm an expert at that, and I wouldn't even want to attempt it at the moment, to be honest. That that that's the thing. I mean, and people who get into that, and people who are thinking about getting into it, you, you make a very very good point. There is the unreliability of some of this old tech, and you know these things will will break down. They used to break down all the time when they were being used back in the eighties and nineties. So they're going to break down again, yeah. and I've it's the cost of replacing it. You know, or, or doing it up. Yeah, I've actually got a friend who owns an original Donkey Kong Junior um, arcade, and oh, but he again he had to send the whole arcade board. Obviously, the 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 game is on a massive circuit board. He he couldn't find any anyone in the UK who would sort of do it for a reasonable price to sort of recap the whole thing and fix it because it it, it arrived in a broken state. Hmm. Um, and he ended up having to send it to someone in Australia because that was cheaper than sending it anywhere else. Um, and he waited like a month for it to come back, and it works now, but for how long? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it says come back in a working state, as you said, it brought, you know, had it come back, and you know, sometimes you get things back and they don't work. You definitely send it back to Australia again. And, oh. Yeah. Yeah, there there is a tale there. I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing to get involved in. If that's that's what you want to do, but there are a lot of pitfalls involved in it. And I use the word pit and shove the word money in front of it because uh, yeah, some people do put a lot of time and effort into these, and they're not the most yeah. reliable of things. Yeah, I do actually really enjoy learning about them. Though one of my favourite YouTube channels is um, it's quite famous now. I think it's called Retro Ralph on YouTube. Um, he does loads of like uh, proper arcade sort of pickups and maintenance mm. um, and sort of wheeling and dealing those. And it's really interesting to learn like the innards of these machines. And um, obviously talks about how reliable some of them are and how unreliable some of them are and how 
how dangerous things like repairing CRTs is. But yeah. if you've got the knowledge and the money, then do it. Um, but if the passion is not there and the skill is not there, then don't even yeah. attempt it because you'll just be pissing money basically <laughs> that, that's right you know it's, it's, a, it's a very very good point and and a good advice as well and yeah messing around i mean i, I work with people who work with repairing televisions and yeah they tell us working with crts and things and it's it's a bit of a bit of a dangerous game that so but like you said if you've got the skills to do it it's it's probably worthwhile but if you got haven't really got that knowledge then yeah i've got a lot of respect for people who do do it um, agreed yeah there's a there's a hell of a lot that can go wrong. Um, I personally wouldn't want to be electrocuted to death. So, <laughs> well, I, I can think of better things I'd rather be doing. To be honest with you, you know, that's just just really <laughs> way down on the list of things I'd like to do. But the thing is, you did something like that, people would turn around and say, "Oh, it's it's how he would have wanted to go." No, he wouldn't be. <laughs> no, he wouldn't be. Remember, the, the idiot who opened the back of a CRT and got fifty thousand volts going through me. No, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, open it with a spatula or something. Yeah, anyway, that's right. <laughs> okay, so let, let, let's move on from. So we talked about Gallagher and, Gallagher and the arcade. Um, the second game on your list because we were talking about the Mega Drive, and um, I don't think this one's come up before. I really don't. Uh, yeah. But it's a game everybody's going to know what you're talking about as soon as you mention it. Yeah, so this is one of either Code Master's first game or one of their first games and that is Micro Machines on the Mega Drive. So this is one of those games that my friends wanted to come around my house and play on my Mega Drive to play me against the, against me, even mm. um, even though they had PlayStation 1s, um, because it is just such a fun top-down arcade racer. Um, even now, when my friends go around to them, like, in the <laughs> game room with them, showing them around, I'll be like, you want a quick game of Micro Machines? And they'd be like, yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, absolutely love it, mainly because I always win. <laughs> <laughs> just, well, before it... you, just before you carry on with that, you, you know he said it was Codemaster's first game. Now, I, I, don't like, I don't like to correct people when they're doing things like this, but you, Codemasters were around in the 8-bit days as well with the, the tapes. And is it one the, of their uh, first, is it not, I meant racing games, but uh, yeah. it's probably, probably not, but. It, it, it was. Uh, I mean, they did a, a. I mean, one of the most famous games they did back on on the the, the, the tape based eight bit system was BMX Simulator, which was a top down. Um, okay. it, it's it sold millions, literally. It was like it was a one ninety nine game or two ninety nine. Yeah. I can't remember. It sold millions. It was always in the the top of the charts for years or months or very very long periods of time. I think when you said, for, I think it's more likely that this was one of their first forays into console, uh, the 16-bit consoles because okay. they did do they did do a, um, some games on the NES as well. Yeah. So if you get the Game Genie, that was them getting involved in a product to install cheats, another subject in itself. But they did do some 8-bit games. And then they went... I don't, I don't, somebody might have to correct me on this one. I can't remember whether they, they did games on Super Nintendo or not, but I know certainly on the Mega Drive, um, they were behind Brian Lara's cricket. That was one and and Micro Machine. So that's probably where that's come from. Didn't mean to correct you there, mate. Sorry, I just want we'll to make sure that um, we're not. That's all good. I, I like I like to learn all the facts. Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm I totally missed the eight bit era, so mm. I'm still I'm still learning about it now. To be honest, I've come yeah. across games that I've never seen before on eight bit consoles. Code, yeah, Code Masters were, were massive. That they, they specialise in the budget games. One ninety nine, two ninety nine, and they always put this self promotion on the back of each game. You know, absolutely brilliant. As, as if somebody reviewed it, but it was, it was just them blurbing it, and it was started by by uh, two guys, basically coding in their bedrooms, so going back years and years. And they just evolved, and they they, they completely control the book. It was like they literally seemed like they bring out a game every week. You used to look, you used to look at the top ten best selling, say Spectrum games or Amstrad games or Commodore sixty four games. You can guarantee that that. Against the full price titles, there were probably a couple of budget games in there. And guarantee that it was a something simulator or, or dizzy. That was it. Yeah, dizzy or something simulator. Codemaster <laughs> brought it out, and it would it would sell by the truckload. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, anyway, that's good. No. anyway, micro machines. Sorry, because uh, we're going off on a tangent there. <laughs> that's all right. That's what this show is all about. That's um, it. That's it. So yeah, it's. 
It's one of my favourite racing games and probably started my whole racing game love, to be honest, um, up until now, obviously. Um, Codemasters actually made Dirt Rally and mm-hmm. Dirt, Dirt Rally 2. Um, but I've actually, actually got the, the actual cart in my hand to hand. And um, one of my favourite sort of ways to play this game was you do a, a tournament and all of the i think there was one there was one type of stage per different type of car wasn't there so mm-hmm. you had the the speedboat map and then you had the helicopter map and the tank map there was there was only one map per different type of vehicle so <laughs> much to much to my friend's disappointment it was quite easy for me to learn all the different tracks um, <laughs> I think that's something that's still being good stead now, to be honest. Because, I mean, sometimes when I'm playing these eight-minute rally stages, I know that I don't even listen need to listen to the co-driver anymore because I can remember this eight-minute thing. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I I really enjoyed playing it multiplayer, and um, it was just such such a fun experience compared to everything else at the time in my eyes anyway um it was in 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 hindsight it was my only racing game on the mega drive um so that's probably why i loved it so much um my parents at the time didn't really sort of had the disposable income to buy me all the latest tech and loads of games for whatever even if it even though it was only mega drive um they still weren't cheap cheap sort of thing Mm. Um, and yeah, just I can't believe I've still got the original copy. Um, sorry, I just knocked my microphone there. You have done, <laughs> yes, yeah. Give it a second, it'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think, yeah, yeah, I think you're, back, you're back now, yeah. Getting too enthusiastic with the box, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's such a good arcade racer. I can't, I can't stress how much. How many hours and hours of fun I've had playing against my school friends on it, um, and you know, I think I think they actually, the original game came with because I think I bought it from Blockbusters at the time. Okay. They came with yeah. these inserts that had uh, like party invites to play a micro machine tournament at your house, that you could like write your address <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I because I I picked up the second one. Um, must have been a few years ago now, now we never owned it as a child. Um, and to add all these inserts in, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember those. And I, <laughs> I was like, that is, oh, damn, I don't have those in my original one because I probably sent them out to my school friends. <laughs> I, don't, I never knew that sort of thing existed um, <laughs> in, in games like that. Uh, th- these were the, the, the cartridges where they adapted them so they could fit, you could fit joy, you had joy ports on them, didn't they? So, yeah, the second one had that. Yeah, not the first one, but oh, did it not? Oh, sorry, I stand corrected there. Yeah, yeah, the first one was just two players. So generally, if we had friends over from school, we'd just sort of take it in turns. Winner stays on, sort of thing. <laughs> it's just good fun. I, I must admit, it's, it's not a game I ever really got on with, um, I, I don't know why. I think it must have been to do with the the, the control because you, I think I was just used to playing racing games from behind the racing car. Hmm. So here now, what, what we've got here is a top-down racer. Yeah, it's, um, definitely, it's definitely difficult if you've not experienced that sort of way of playing before. I think that's what I struggle with. And, and I, I I have played it since, to, to be hmm. honest, and, and I, I appreciate it a little bit more than I did at the time. Um, But when, I, when, it, when my friend and my first had it on the Mega Drive, it was like, oh, you know, play that. And it's like... This is just uncontrollable, but they seem to be, you know. So I'm thinking this is uncontrollable, but they're coping perfectly okay with it. But no, I'm the one who's got a problem with it. You know? Yeah, it definitely, <laughs> it definitely has sort of. Um, I mean, there are rudimentary physics in the game, um, but it definitely does sort of kind of translate into how a car should handle. Where if you do minimal inputs into the game then it's go you're going to drive more smoothly and get more speed out of corners mm. uh, whereas if you're just sort of hammering a, 
a turn and doing a massive drift, you're not going to go as fast around the corner. You, um, you, may have, you, you may have established what my problem was then. <laughs> <laughs> not too difficult to work that one out. Um, did you, yeah, no, did people you... do definitely struggle when they haven't had experience with micro machines and you sort of dump them in the deep end and you put them on the pool table level with the uh, Formula One cars. Mm. Um, the first time I put Natasha on it, she just kept driving off the edge of the pool table. I was like, "What are you doing?" And I was, she was like, "I thought I pressed left," and you, I went right. I was like, yeah. "Because you're going down the other way." <laughs> the same, same problem I had, and you know that, that's that's it. So I, I'm in, I'm in good company there. Just, just. Not the, did you play any more of the games in the series on the Mega Drive? Did you, you mention? I know, I know, it's like I think it was they said Mark Machines too. I know there was a military edition as well. I think. Um, sadly, not at the time. To be honest. Um, I only really had about four or five games for the Mega Drive. Mm. Um, I think those original five were Sonic, Micro Machines, Batman, um, what else was there? Marvel Madness, and FIFA, and um, European Club Soccer, which is kind of the same thing. Mm. Oh, Batman as well. That's good. I've got, I've, I picked up last year, I think it was. Um, yeah, it was. I'm looking at it now. Um, did you ever did you ever play the the, the updated Micro Machines version on the PlayStation Two? No. So after that, I I just I didn't really get into the Micro Machines franchise because they have a lot of games out. I didn't realize there originally how many there actually are. There's probably like at least three per console. Yeah. Um, yeah. From that sort of time. Um, uh, I have picked up the old few. I've got I've got one for the N sixty four, and obviously got the second one for my, for the Mega Drive. Mm. But um, I found that they weren't as fun when they got to three D. To be honest, yeah, I, I did a game plan at age a couple of years back now. I think it was, um, which is in the depths of my channel somewhere. And it was, I thought, well, I'll give this a go. And and, and you're right, it, it's it's from a slightly different perspective. Not, it's not the it's not the classic micro machines look. It's slightly different, so in a way, for me, that's a bonus from the start because I can't cope with the old system. But it's a it's a very average game, and I think yeah. if it hadn't got the name micro machines attached to it, you just wouldn't give it more than ten minutes worth of your time. Yeah, they changed everything, not just the graphics or the perspective. The the physics changed as well. There was more controls, um, more different. Things like power ups and swell as well, and I, I was that just yeah didn't didn't interest me. You, you can see why they try and do these things, but at the same time, what makes a game successful originally is is that classic style of gameplay. It's it, you mentioned Sonic. I always say that about Sonic. I ask people the question: Sonic, you know, two D or three D? Very very few people say three D. No, it's always very very few 2D. people. Yeah, it got to be two D. Sonic's a 2D game. But then again, if you apply the same logic to Mario, you say 2D or 3D, I would say 3D because I prefer the 3D games to the 2D ones. Yeah, I would say the same, but then again, I wasn't... I didn't have a SNES or anything, so I, mm. can't, I can't really judge too much. Not Neither did I, but I, I from, from playing them in later years, I don't mind the 2D ones, but I get much more enjoyment of uh, playing you know, Mario 64 or Sunshine or uh, 3D land or, or whatever. I'm I'm just happier playing those games. It's it's strange. Uh, you can see why they want to update it, but you move it too far away from that core rudimental rud rudimentary gameplay that you need. And then anybody who's played a game like you do with say micro machines as often as you had done, you're gonna notice any immediate difference and you think this isn't this isn't the game I remember. So Yeah, for sure. You just want the same sometimes you want to be able to just chill while you're playing something mm. uh, you don't want to be thinking about complexities within certain games you just want to have fun sometimes and there's That's nothing right. wrong with that absolutely agree absolutely agree um i'll tell you what we'll do because I, I did say something like we'll, we'll step away from your six games for the moment because the, the rest of the games on this are pretty much going to cover the next section of your gaming history yeah, that's I think it, I think it would make more sense to talk your gaming history. Then we'll take those final four games from you, from your list, and then we'll, we'll we'll move on there. So after yes. after the after the Mega Drive, we, we, when you came back to the UK, obviously you were playing PlayStations at the time. You were obviously with the Mega Drive. 
So what happened going from there? Um, so obviously I had a lot of exposure to the PlayStation 1, um, but never enough to, for me to sort of say to my parents, oh, I want a PlayStation 1 for Christmas. Um, I sort of went with went with the idea that just just be happy with what you've got um and then must have been what year did the playstation 2 come out in europe it was 2005 maybe uh, i was earlier than that, i think um to 2003 maybe i think I, I think you're probably looking at maybe it might have been even 99 2000 maybe right. 2001 but well, it's not anyway. a gaming. It's not a gaming history uh, um, program. This one, so we'll we'll just say early to early two thousands. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't until at least two thousand three that I actually got a PlayStation Two. That's for sure. Mm. Um, and yeah, that was sort of an amazing um, sort of time in my gaming career because um, I didn't expect my parents to even be able to afford one. Um, when they came back from Cyprus, they were obviously a bit more strapped for cash. Um, I think they just bought their first house back in the UK. Mm. Um, so kind of <laughs> a similar at the time that I'm experiencing at the moment. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they bought me and my brother PlayStation 2 around 2003 and absolutely fell in love with it. I just... I, again, it was a, another quantum leap because obviously the console I owned was the Mega Drive, and then I went to, from the Mega Drive to a PlayStation Two, mm. and that was a massive leap. Um, me and my brother absolutely loved. Um, I think we got the bundle with Ratchet and Clank, which was Ratchet and Clank Two, I think. Um, and yeah, we just played the hell out of it, and yeah, I. I, I still to this day can't sort of fathom how how much of a jump I've actually had sometimes with these mm. these console generations. You have jumped around. It's uh, it, it's it's certainly a, a, a gaming history which is a lot different to to what I've discussed with other uh, guests on the program. Yeah, yeah. So when I've been listening to previous people, they were obviously a little bit older than me, but <laughs> they're obviously sort of talking about gen to gen and mm. for me for me starting off it has quite, kind of been like i'm jumping two maybe three gens at a time until the early 2000s um and yeah really really enjoyed playstation 2 it's it was obviously a machine that the parents they obviously bought it as well because it's a dvd player physical yeah. me physical media is starting to come about um so it was multi-purpose, and that that was good good for us all, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was again you had you had the bonus. I mean, both the Xbox and, and the PlayStation Two were able to do that. Yeah. But you, you, you know, it, it it was you know like any console is it's always a big outlay of money, but there's always something certainly from that era onwards. You think, and we will talk a bit more about PlayStation Three and Four afterwards with Blu-ray and, and the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, of having that extra bit of tech attached to it, which makes it, yeah, it's a lot of money to fork out. But actually, you're not just getting a PlayStation Two; you're getting a DVD player. And around this time, which you would have probably um, had your PlayStation Two, I maybe two years previously had paid about 190 quid for a DVD player on its own. So if you're, you know, I think the PlayStation was it three ninety nine, probably something like that. I don't know. We've been close yeah, to like a couple of three. You cut the three hundred quid, and you'll get you're getting a hundred and fifty pound piece of tech to go in there with it at the same time. It, it makes makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, makes sense. Um, that 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 love the PlayStation has has really followed me through the years. Um, I've still got my childhood PlayStation two, and that is the one. It's actually, as you can see on my channel, the one that I speak in front of a lot of the time. <laughs> and I love the fact that it still still works. And I've not had to modify it in any way. Um, not even had it recapped yet, because I I think it's still going strong. I've noticed no difference in how it plays. 
Mm. Um, the only thing I've changed to make it sort of HDMI compatible is um, this adapter, which you can get for other consoles as well. It's made by a company called Retro Tink in America. Uh, it's yep. called Rad, Rad 2X. So, so the 2X means it's two times upscaler. So you plug it into the original um, AV out, and then it does clever upscaling on this little chip chipset or this little PCB, and then outputs to, I don't know why, but it's outputs to mini HDMI, not normal HDMI, but whatever, I've got a mini HDMI to HDMI cable out of the back of it. And as such, it, it plays in 480p instead of the um, native 240. Mm. Okay. And it does look incredible. It's also got this little um, button on the back that is um, a smoothing filter. So it makes um, 3D polygons look more smooth. Um, so when you're playing 3D games, it, it does sometimes look like a modern remake. Um, mm. And I, th I think that's so cool that the love of the PlayStation is still very much there and you're still able to buy these adapters and continue your love for these consoles. Mm. Um, and my PS2 collection has just been growing over the years because I think PlayStation 2 is probably one of the... Obviously, there are some expensive games, but I think it's one of the least expensive consoles to collect for. Um, That's, that, yeah, that, that, there's little, I mean, yeah, you can walk into any... CX, or, you know, a charity shop, and, and you, you will see the most common uh, console game you'll see there's PlayStation 2, guarantee it. Yeah. And a lot of the games are cheap, you know. And, and again, don't let that put people off because something's, you know, going for 50p or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad game. There are some really, really, really good quality games for that system that won't cost you an awful lot of money. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about preservation as well. I try and, even though, um, <laughs> probably laugh, but I, I I buy these physical games. I'm trying to backfill my collection at the moment. I've not got actually many more to collect, to be honest. I'm trying to yeah. backfill my childhood collection, so games that me and my brother played on PS2, but then for whatever reason sold at Blockbuster probably at the time, and never bought back into a collection because we were like, well, we played it. Why do we need it back, sort of thing? But yeah. now now that I've got that that um, disposable income and that nostalgia to go back and play these games. I've been sort of buying these games back. And um, instead of playing them off the disc, I will generally just, I'll, I'll maybe play them once off the disc and then I'll put them in into my, um, my Linux laptop and I'll just, I'll just um, rip it to a DVD ISO file. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'll burn that onto um, a hard drive adapter that goes back into the PS2 and just play that. You just um, I've got a custom memory card, so again, it's not it's not modded at all. But it's a custom memory card that boots into custom software, mm -hmm. and then you're able to play these files from the hard drive. So that means um, I'm preserving the original disc because I'm not playing off the original disc as such. I've just I've to, I find it quite satisfying that I've taken the image of the game that I've either had for my childhood or bought recently, burned that onto a hard drive, and I am playing my copy on that hard drive. I've not, not, mm. I'm not just going on the internet and downloading it, um, which is, is obviously... <laughs> well, there, there, is, there is that option, yes, but um, I, I know this, this is a, a very uh, passionate subject of yours and interest and um we, we discussed this uh, previously so that's something which again is a topic for exploration certainly yeah when uh, what games did you have back then that, that you you can need to pick back up um so there's the burnout series which obviously are quite cheap games now quality um, series as well yeah absolutely love those games i get obviously because they were multiplayer they were good because me and my brother could play them at the same time mm. um there's a there's a common theme around 
the PlayStation 2 with that. Um, I mean, we had the, obviously, had Ratchet and, Ratchet and Clank. I don't think Ratchet and Clank was actually multiplayer until maybe the fourth one, which was Gladiator, I think. I'll just um, see if I've got that one. I've got one and I've got one th- three, I think. Yeah. Um, but but um, the Naughty Dog games we generally both loved. So my brother was actually more into Jack and Daxter, and I was more into Ratchet and Clank. And we both played the hell out of those. Um, I think we only had Jack and Daxter one and two, um, but probably had literally every ratchet and clank game just because um we both loved them rather than just one of us um because i didn't really i did like jack and Dexter, but not as much as ratchet and clank but my brother Mm -hmm. enjoyed ratchet and clank as well so we generally find the birthdays and christmas we got ratchet and clank games because yeah it was one every couple years or so yeah i I, I prefer ratchet and clank um yeah yeah I don't know what you just do. You just do. Yeah, I've recently, um, I think it was on PS Plus a while back, the HD remaster of the first game on PS4. Right. I downloaded that, and I was like, I had to go back on the PS2 and play that on the original <laughs> hardware because that 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 is such a fun game. Mm. So you quite enjoy the, the the old platform games then. Um, and... Yeah, PlayStation 2 was definitely a console that ignited a new love for 3D platformers for, for me and my brother, um, as well as the arcade races like uh, Burnout. Um, I was also really into um, Need for Speed Carbon. Oh, um, yeah. I've literally lost count how many times I completed that game. Um, I think I got to the point where I was like, I think I can complete the whole game with the SOS car if I put my mind to it. <laughs> and, and sure enough, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like the, one of the first cars you get is like a 70s Chevrolet Camaro SS or something. Mm. And it's um, absolutely horrendous at cornering, but it's all right at a straight line. Um, but yeah, I managed to complete the whole game. Um, the AI is actually sort of beatable if you sort of block when he tries to overtake it certain points. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I mean I love the I love the Need for Speed series. I know there's some there's some not to good games in there, but I mean oh, I just just love them. It's my my style of game, racing game to play that one. I mean yeah. I lost so many hours playing them. They've definitely got a lot of replay replayability to them. Mm. Um um, I think I must have completed it at least five times when I was a child and then probably another two or three times since. Um, and every time it's sort of chosen a different car and you don't have to 100% it every time you play through it, do you? You can just, um, as long as you do some of the main missions and some of the side missions, you can sort of um, pick through it um, and you can sort of vary your your story mode that way mm. um and i i think i also had most wanted which is absolutely awesome game because obviously, obviously you had sort of more chase the police chase style um and the police in need for speed carbon were a bit crap to be honest you, you, could, <laughs> you could easily lose them if you just like hid in an alleyway basically um but on most wanted please. the police were sort of more ruthless i think they were more stupid back then i think they're, they're a bit more clued up now <laughs> um i mean hot, hot pursuits were my favorite games on, on playstation 3 uh, yeah that was good as well love that. absolutely love that I, i've been tempted to invest in the the, the playstation 4 remake but i don't know if i'm just paying for tarted up graphics i don't really want to be going down that route i, I love three three uh hot pursuit was brilliant on playstation 3 really love that yeah i can't say i've touched one since the playstation 3 and i think the ones i did have on playstation 3 like i think the last one the the most recent one i played was pro street mm. and um i think that was towards the end of the ps2 era because it might have come out on ps2 and 3 but um yeah i remember not enjoying that game as much as i enjoyed carbon 
um, and ended up going back to play Carbon because it was just yeah. more fun. I, I I played Pro Street on the 360. I yeah. quite enjoyed that. I, I, I don't. It didn't take much to amuse me and, and get me into something. If it's you know, I'm not an expert on these things by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm, I'm happy throwing myself around corners and, and doing that. And um, some you get more out of than others. Some you work with, you know, some work with you better, some don't. And uh, but yeah, I, I, I thought I thought Pro Street was all right. Yeah, it was, it was an all right game. I still still completed it, even though I didn't enjoy it as much. Um, but yeah, there's certainly some games that you have more nostalgia for, for whatever reason. Mm. Um, and because of that, they've got more replayability. Um, and yeah, I really in, enjoy that effect that I know I can get the same or very similar experience going back to a game I don't need to play a modern remaster because mm. those those graphics are normal to me, um, which I I find a, a good thing to be honest. Yeah, I, I, that's a very good point, and, and I, I would be inclined to to agree with you on, on that. I think it's uh, put, what put me off, you know, upgrading on some some games that have had the HD remaster. But then again, some of them I think have improved on the originals. Uh, you said you were trying to collect all these games that you had back when you were, when you were younger. Uh, so you said you you get getting close to getting those now. You got many to collect, or is anything you're missing in particular? I don't think so. I think there's actually only two left. Because um, mm. I I picked I pick up a load when I go to Vintage Game Boy. Where I've met you once because um, yeah, they have yeah. a, a ton of PS2 in there. He's only got a couple in there. <laughs> the pile about five, five and a half foot high on off from the floor to the top, and, and yeah, there's loads of them. I loads could fill my entire game through floor to ceiling with the amount of PS2 in there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we all could. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's good because you can get them really cheap. Um, mm. I think I've literally only got the one of the Lord of the Rings games, possibly the Two Towers, which was, I think, one of the one player versions of Lord of the Rings because mm. Return of the King was the first sort of multiplayer hack and slash I remember playing because at a campaign mode, didn't it, where you could um, hack and slash your way through the movie sort of thing. Yeah. Um, with a second player playing through the campaign with you. But the Two Towers was a game that it's not an expensive game, but it's just one of the first hack and slashes I remember playing on the PS2. So there's that. And um, rather amusingly, the other the only other game is a Wallace and Gromit game, which is the, <laughs> the C- Curse of the Were Rabbit, I think it was. But Curse of, yes, I, I, know, I know the one. Yeah, yeah. I looked it up the other day, and I could see why my my brother sold it because it was like average reviews for like five point five out of ten. It wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, not not wishing to rub it in, but I think I got both of those. <laughs> Yeah. I, I know I've definitely got the but as you said that they're not they're not hard to find in, yeah I prefer to save when I'm trying to complete a collection I prefer to save those easy ones for the end so it feels like the end is easily in sight sort of thing yeah I, I think believe believe me I think there's a lot of people myself included sitting there thinking you know what if I'd done that <laughs> it, it'd have been a lot more easier because I, I I find that now when I, I'm trying to buy certain games for certain systems that I could walk into somewhere and, and be greeted with a wall or a shelf load and go, oh, great. And then go through every single one. Got, 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 got. I've been back at school with football stickers. And it's, it's yeah, if I'd gone the other way around, okay, I'll start with the really hard ones that you don't see anywhere and then just leave me the easy ones to finish with. That's great because the easy ones to finish with, you can buy them in bulk. And they don't take an awful lot of your time to do it. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think I've I, I done it. You can yeah, find them at uh, most retro shops. So yeah, yeah, and um, and they'll be glad to get rid of them. Most of them. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 that's why that's why vintage Dame would do such a good deal. <laughs> Turn up there and just take a pile out of them. Yeah, last time I was in there, he gave me four for a tenner. So I think that's not pretty bad. reasonable. I'm doing good. I was I was in there the other night after work, so um, I'm not going to spoil my uh, <laughs> a future pickles video on that one. But uh, <laughs> first time I've been in for a few weeks, actually. Yeah, uh, because they literally just down the road from me. But yeah, that, yeah, we we met up there in August, was it? 
July. Yeah, yeah, July or August. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I won that long ago. Is that? I, I didn't actually realise till recently that it is actually equidistant to what I would consider my local retro shop, which is Retro Games HQ in Swindon. Because mm. um, even though that's closer um, mileage-wise, it's actually the same. Because it's um, it's just all motorway for me from Cheltenham to Hale Zone or wherever it is. Mm, that's um, right. Yeah. Whereas Swindon, it's a bit out of the way. You're sort of after you get off the dual carriageway, you driving twenty minutes sort of thing. Whereas mm. getting off the motorway for vintage game and it's right there. So. That's it. Well, I mean, the good thing about about round round here is that you've got probably three or four decent sized town centres, which will have lots of charity shops and CEX etc. And we've got quite an abundance of retro gaming shops as well. So. Oh, in a way, that's, that's why a lot of people do. You know, you've been down yourself. I've, I've bumped into other people from other parts of the country who've, who've been in there. People, well, sometimes I know they're going, and then sometimes I walk in there and I have to bump into two people that I've never met before, but I've watched, I've watched on YouTube for about eighteen months. Uh, that one one time I walked in there, and yeah, I do, people come, I, come from far wide. I do absolutely love the fact that there are more small retro game shops popping up all over the place. Um, I recently did a video on, um, it used to be just a website, it was called uh, Super Game Boy Shack, I think it was called. Mm. Um, but then he opened a shop in Leicester, which is, it's not too far, it's an hour and, it's an hour and 40, I think, for me. So it's not, mm. it's not undoable in a day. Um, but we went there recently for a weekend because of the Leicester Space Museum, which we both love space, so we wanted to go there anyway. Um, but yeah, he, he bought a, well, rented out a space in centre of Leicester, and it's called uh, Super Game Shack, not Super Game Boy Shack. Um, but he's basically gone from this tiny little website to a proper physical shop, and it is one of the best shops I've ever been in. Um, mm. And it, all looked, of these... it looked amazing. It looked amazing from your video, I have to say. Yeah. Um, highly recommend it to anyone and that that sort of thing really keeps me going because it's sort of saying to me well that passion for retro is out there it's getting more popular um it's here to stay sort of thing um and the owners are generally incredibly reasonable with their prices um you'll generally find they'll try and undercut cex a little bit if not massively um, which is another benefit to supporting them. Mm. Um, I would much prefer to support a independent shop than I would CEX. Um, I agree. Admittedly, I agree. some people have no choice. They only have CEX and not much within two hours of them or mm. even an hour. But, um, yeah, I I've, I've sometimes feel spoiled just because, like, I mean, you know that having retro game shops close to you is just a godsend really so building yeah, your yeah. collections and getting good prices on things that's it and it, and, and they get to know you going in there as well and, and you it's not you're not so much just a, a person going in there shopping you go in a few times and they get to know you and um that's always a good thing and i i agree with that entirely i would much rather I'm not knocking CEX because everybody does that. And sometimes it is the only place you said some people can go. Sometimes it's the only place you can get certain things. Uh, you ha you have to end up having to go there because you've got a better chance of picking that up in there than somewhere else. But I would much rather give my money to charity shops or the local independent retailers because they're the ones who need it the most. Yeah, uh, and I, I especially drove that home during COVID times, so I was like, well, I'm not going to see yet. It's because they'll just survive easily. Mm. Uh, they'll just sell their stock online and they'll be fine. But these small retro shops, they generally, they generally don't have websites to sell their stock on. Um, you have to go there in person and buy their stuff. Um, and as you say, they'll generally form a relationship with you. They'll message you if you know you, you collect for something in specific. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute godsend for my wife as well because <laughs> um, I'll be like messaging Pete. Pete is the owner of a Retro Games HQ in Swindon and be like, oh, have you got this? And he'll be like, oh, no, not at the moment, but I'll let you know when it comes in. Mm. And then 
Natasha will message him on Instagram and be like, what can I get Dale for his birthday? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, that's great. That is really good. But yeah, you need to... It often comes with, with a stigma that sometimes they are more expensive, but again, if, you, if you're going anywhere, like they'll cut your deals. You, the, more you, the, the more you buy, the more likely you are to get a good deal on the prices. And um, yeah. Especially if you're trading in stuff as well. Yeah, I found you, that, especially at Vintage Gamer, when I I took in, um, it was actually a quite a funny uh, bit of a tangent, but a, a workmate, he, he came up to me at work a few months back and he's like, Dale, I found this like, N64 and some games in my loft. I was going to chuck it. Do you want it? Chuck it. I was like, don't chuck it. <laughs> <laughs> don't throw then, it out. And then he came in the next day. I brought it in my car because he was like, "Oh, um, obviously, you want your car to take it home." And at the time, I was like, "I was sort of um, with my new house. I'm in walking distance, so sometimes I take the car, sometimes I walk." But I sort of brought the car in, met him at lunchtime, and gave me this box. Um, I was expecting a Nintendo 64 with like maybe one game. Mm. I opened it, and it wasn't even a Nintendo 64. It was a Super NES boxed with like 13 g- games and i was like bloody oh. hell <laughs> you were gonna throw this in the bin and you yeah i just couldn't believe it i can't believe that either <laughs> wow L- so, l- luckily you spoke to somebody who knew what they were knew what they were on about because if you spoke to somebody else ah now chuck it out it's a place to <laughs> that. yeah yeah i um i think i took it to a vintage gamer and um even though i I I was I was a good sport about it. I I traded it in. I think they gave me about a hundred quid, um, which seemed reasonable. Um, mm. It was about eighty percent of what I would have got if I'd sold it on eBay, um, which saved me a lot of hassle, obviously. Yeah. Um, then I obviously gave the cash back to my workmate, um, but because of me trading that in that day, I bought so many other items for a, a massively reduced price because they're giving you trading rates they're obviously not going to give you full retail um but their stock they've obviously bought it at a lower cost anyway so for them to get in preferable stock is is a good thing for them and you sort of thing absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah, that, that, that's can't argue with any of that at all. And if you have anybody listening, you know, have a local independent game shop close by, or um, you know, of one in a reasonable distance, or you've never explored the possibility of going to one, then do so because honestly, the the benefits of doing it and, and becoming a, a regular patron of theirs will will, will cast you a, a good fettle in the long run. I think that's the best way to describe it because um, I, I see people doing that more and more now. To be honest with you, I think yeah. more and more gamers are when when the old pickups video pops up, it's less about I've got this from CX and charity shops. I've popped into this local retailer and and got a, a good deal. Whenever I go down to um, when we go down to Claire's mum's, um, I always make them go into Western Supermare because <laughs> there, there there's a, a there's a, a local independent game shop in there. Oh, nice. um, I, I've never actually I've only bought one thing out of there ever, but Again, uh, it, it's it's most it's, it's like I think it's most about a third third games, a third all the collectible figures and a, and a third all the the weird, horror-y, gothy stuff as well. Um, but it's it's a great little shop to, to go to, and I always always make the effort to try and get there if we're down there for a, for the week or a few days and spend a little just pop in there the one day and have a look around. I'll have to put that on my uh, maps because <laughs> my, <laughs> most my, most of my Google Maps is just like. Um, you know, you can make custom lists of like places you want to go. Mm. Mine's just mostly independent retro game shops. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes to show, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. That's, that's 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 your hobby. So, um, okay. Uh, so after the PlayStation Two, we we, yep. we move on to to the the next one. Yeah. So that would be the PlayStation Three. Um, always been a playstation kid is if you can call it that um and playstation 3 was sort of for me for me it, at the time i was sort of a teenager 
um, it was the biggest jump I would I had seen in a long time. So obviously, since the Mega Drive to mm. PlayStation, PlayStation Two, because um, you obviously went from composite to HDMI. You suddenly using completely different screen technology as well, and um, Blu-ray movies, of course, mm. um, and PlayStation Three opened up a whole new world for me because um, I had a, lo- a small love for RPGs before the PS3, but the RPG love really exploded in that era. Um, and that is mainly down to one of the games on my list, mm-hmm. which which is Dragon Age Origins. Yep. Um, so I haven't actually heard anyone on the podcast talk about this game, which I'm kind of surprised about really, because there's been other people who love their RPGs on the show. But Dragon Age Origins is, in my opinion, one of the best RPGs ever made. Um, I have I have played Final Fantasy VII, even though I've not ever owned a PlayStation 1. Um, I just bought the disc once and played on PlayStation 2, and it was epic. Um, so I, so I was, I've always had a love for RPGs, but it exploded with Dragon Age Origins because the amount of depth that that game went into was incredible. That the whole concept of having these amazing cutscenes and amazing combat was just incredible for me. Um, I think I've played through it about four times now, all different. You can play through it in different classes. So I think you've got Rogue warrior and mage Hmm. Uh, my favorite is mage just because um it's not a rpg where you're just on your own you um sort of make up a party of uh four other companions so these are obviously ai companions you meet through the story and um they're obviously different classes as well so you generally have i don't know me as a mage you'd get two other warriors in and maybe either another mage or a rogue. And then they'd all have different specialities in the combat system, which I absolutely love the depth of that because you could, you could even set like what sort of um, strategies you wanted your AI characters to use, mm. like to be more defensive or aggressive, um, dependent on um, different variables so you could be you could literally spend hours on the menus just being so anal about how you wanted your certain characters to attack certain beasts if they were big or had certain amounts of health or were about to die or things like that um and yeah that that level of depth just got me into rpgs and there's another one i'll talk about later but um that spurred a love of the Dragon Age series, obviously. Mm. Uh, the second game was still really, really good on PS3. Um, the third one, Inquisition, was also on PS3, but it was at the end of the PS3's life cycle. So I think in- Dragon Age Inquisition came out the um, same year as the PlayStation 4, so you can buy it on PS4 or 3. I think I've actually got both versions now because... Um, I just thought, yeah, I love that series so much. I'll try and get every copy, sort of mm-hmm. thing. Um, but Dragon Age Origins. Sorry, I'm just going off on the one. But um, no, it's alright. Okay, I'm out. The, uh, the the story is you're basically um, this this guy who's um, sort of awoken from a, like a dream type state, and the cutscenes are just amazing. It's sort of a dream type state and you're in something called the fade which is like a a world between worlds so you're sort of between um sort of reality and hell sort of thing Mm -hmm. um so you have these sort of demons that play tricks on you in the fade and you've got to defeat these demons and escape from the fade um and then there's so much depth to this to the actual sort of mechanics of the characters because um, different characters have sort of, especially mages, they have sort of relations with the Fade. So 
they have sort of um, they can either be quite evil where they use um, the fade to their advantage where they'll sort of summon demons and so uh, you'll get something called a blood mage which is like in Dragon Age world that's like the most powerful kind of mage and sort of frowned upon by all of the other factions within the game and um, it's basically a constant war in all of the games between the Templars who are sort of anti-magic but they've got a magi circle which they're all kept in a tower and then you've got um, some bits of the game where you're obviously trying to save the mage from mages from not being slaughtered by the Templars because of one mage doing something bad mm -hmm. um, because they all have free will um, and you can influence the story dependent on your decisions based in the cut games I'm not sure if this is making any sense, but <laughs> well, that's the great thing about the RPG because yeah. they, 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 you've got to have this real story to them. So you've got all that build up, and you need to understand all this. Now, I mean, yeah, you know, it, it's not my, it's not my sort of genre. It's not my sort of game. But those people who do play those games, like yourself, know an awful lot about them. And there might be people out there who, who you know, might be interested in hearing that side of it rather than just talk about an overview of the game so yeah again they are games with high incredibly high replayability i don't think there's there's many games that you can play so many times and have a different outcome each time um, well, it keeps quick keeps you playing doesn't it so yeah the, definitely the, different alter so you, you were you not interested in rpgs before this or was there a slight interest before you started playing these games um not particularly to be honest i'd i played the odd sort of rpg on i think i might have played well there's the lord of the rings games on pc or playstation 2 which are kind of like rpgs um i'd played final fantasy 7 before that just i had a playstation 1 disc that i just got give i think i might have got it from a car boot even and just thought mm. i'll play it, i'll play it before i sell it because it was hailed as being one of the greatest games of all time and when i was playing through it i could see why um so i had had exposure to rpgs obviously ff7 is more of a jrpg so it's turn-based yeah. whereas Dra dragon age is live action um i actually find those live action rpgs more difficult because you've you've not got much time to think about your decisions when you're in combat um and that is a big selling point to me is how how much depth is there to the combat on how much this game sort of appeals to me um because as you'll find out later there's rpg games that i think people love all for the wrong reasons okay yeah. um i think if you've got i think a good rpg game has got to have good combat um there's no excuse to not have it um there's loads of games with good combat um one of the best combat systems i've ever experienced is on a game called dragon's dogma which is an incredibly lesser known game and yeah. has has these incredible combat mechanics on it where you can sort of climb onto the monster's that you're attacking back or something or you can climb them kind of a sort of a mix between shadow of the colossus and lord of the rings style okay yeah um so, so yeah you've got these incredible games with incredible combat and obviously you can vary how you you attack different beasts or humans or whatever in dragon age um doesn't quite have the complexity of Dragon's Dogma, but it has enough complexity to sort of keep me interested because you can constantly sort of evolve your way of playing. Um, if you want to, you can easily just um, buy a potion and reset all of your stats, basically. So you can go from being one type of mage to a complete different type of mage. Mm -hmm. And you can just do that in the middle of the game if you wanted to. Um, that's the most boring bit of the game when Natasha watches me play. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're right. We've had lots of different variations of these games 
on, on here previously. This is the first time it's come up, this particular... I must be, again, not being something that I've got, got an interest in, these sort of series passed me by. I'm always interested to hear about why people like them and what they're all about. And most times I'll, I'll, I'll sit there thinking, you know what, there's a good story to that. Or there's a sound like there's a, a real decent characterization going on and it's all very interesting but again i just don't think it's the sort of game i'm going to sit down and play if if anyone asks me oh what's what 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 rpg would you recommend as a mm. starting point i would always say dragon age origins um it's made by bioware who have obviously made a lot of other big games um published by ea um so there is a lot of talent when it comes to making these games. And as I said, the stories are just epic compared to everything else. Um, and, and yeah, it was the first game I experienced where you could change the ending or at any, at any point you could change the path you went down just by choosing a different sort of speech connotation when you were in a cutscene, like mm. you could choose to attack someone or you could choose to re try and reason with them or run away or whatever. I, I, I like the concept that I, I, I like the, your choice of response or your choice of speech will actually affect what happens next rather than just as, as part of the game. Yeah. And there is a huge community behind Dragon Age as well. Um, mainly for the PC sub games gamers so it obviously came out on pc as well um but it's a huge modding community around that because because there are so many different ways you can go in the game people have sort of modded um sort of their mini dlcs into it as well so that you can get even more depth from these games <laughs> and well, yeah, it's you, incredible well you, you're not going to believe this because I, I thought i'd just better double check this to make sure i've, I've not got any of these games mysteriously lurking in some part of the corner of the gaming pantry or this the store where they are and lo and behold uh i have dragon age inquisition on the 360. <laughs> I, I can only presume it must have been one of those times where I, it was like in a, a bucket for 10p or something like that or it would it was just too good an opportunity to turn down so there we go i have absolutely no excuse now for not playing that game <laughs> Inquisition is a close second to Origins. Um, the second one, the story is not that great, to be honest, but mm. it's still got the same sort of mechanics, so it's still worth playing. Um, but Inquisition is the one that I actually bought it recently on PlayStation 4 um, because, like I said, it came out at the end of PS3 or Xbox 360 era, mm. but it also came out on PS4. as like one of the PS first PS4 games. I bought it on PS4 um, and just started playing through it on my PS5 so that it runs in the, um, I don't think it has a PS5 patch, but it has the um, PS4 Pro patch so it will run in the highest frame rate sort of thing. And I, I wanted to complete Dragon Age Origins and number two sort of fairly quickly recently so I could get around to playing it because I... <laughs> I, I love going back to play these games and just playing through all of them. I don't, I don't like just jumping into, say, Inquisition. Um, I prefer to have the story fresh in my mind. And um, Dragon Age, even Inquisition, has even more um, in-depth sort of way of setting the backstory. Mm -hmm. So the way you play through the first and the second game your decisions can sort of be saved to your save file and then your save file will be uploaded to the EA servers and then there's a website, I think it's called Dragon Age Keep and that will basically save all of your decisions from the previous two games and put them in Inquisition. Oh, okay. Which, which yeah. I think is awesome. It's That's the only right. game yeah, I can that. think of that can play that. Can play like that. Uh, and because of that, you'll cut your cutscenes from the get-go in an Inquisition are different. Um, obviously, well, not all of them are different, but and if you were to just start playing Inquisition, it would just set a sort of a default uh, world. But um, mm -hmm. that that option is there, and I really really like it for that. 
I, 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 I that sounds brilliant. I, I didn't even know that sort of thing was possible. So, wow, that that is, that is really really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know anything about that at all. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, what, it's what, a great, what a great idea. Yeah, and not. I can't think of any other RPG game on certainly the PS3 or 4 era that does the same. To be honest, no, I, 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 I've never heard of that. So I think you might be right. If any, if there is anything, people can let us know in the comments. That that will yeah, be definitely be do. Inter- interesting to know that because if you, if you're just the one game that, that you know about, then you might just be the only one there to do with that. Hmm. Um, okay, moving away from from Dragon Age, um, PlayStation Three. Any other memorable games that you had there or experiences you had with it? Um, so I mentioned that um, those were quite fun just to play either a controller or on a TV steering wheel, whatever you've got available, to be honest, because I just I just love those sort of arcade-style dirt games as well as the more realistic ones. Mm. Um, Burnout Paradise was a big love on PS3 as well. Um, one of the best games ever made, in my opinion, for the arcade range since that is. Yeah. Because um, it's a free roam dirt g- a burnout game. I mean, what's not to love? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's obviously other RPGs on the PS3. Um, obviously, Rockstar Games made the most well known ones like uh, Red Dead Redemption number one, mm. um, which are technically, could you, that is an RPG. Um, and so is Gran Turismo. Uh, sorry, not Gran Turismo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gran, Gran Turismo is a bit of an RPG at times. Yeah, yeah. Grand Theft Auto Four and Five on mm. PS3 also big loves of mine. Um, I think I think that's one of the only games I ever queued up for at midnight was Grand. Uh, so I keep saying Grand Turismo. Grand, <laughs> Theft, Grand Theft Auto Five on the PS3. When it first came out, was one of the only games I've ever queued up at midnight for. Mm. Um, unfortunately, there used to be two um, game shops in Cheltenham. One was just Game, the, the big retailer, and one was just an independent one. And uh, the queue at Game was absolutely massive for it. And then I ran literally five minutes walk, and there was this little independent shop. And there was literally me and one other person waiting for it. <laughs> so... hey, there you go. There you go. <laughs> What we were saying not long that long ago about independent game shops, they always yes. have the stuff and Skip always, the always, always happy to see you. I've, I've, I've never done, I've never felt the need to get a game, you know, uh, practically as soon as the, 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 the store opens. I've gone maybe on a, a release day or in my own time or yeah. a, a day or so afterwards. I, I can wait a day or so. My life doesn't revolve around me getting that game straight away but i can understand what some people do yeah. and that and, it, and it's it's it was like an event wasn't it that that was there you had the, the, the call of duty games which were an event people would, would queue up but yeah. you know through the night or be there at midnight to get a copy of the game as soon as it came onto the shelf yeah gta um, gta 5 was a, a landslide game it was heavily advertised um and i, I would say it lived up to and exceeded the expectations in most people's eyes um to the point where it's still being played now mm. um and at the at the time i had just got my first sort of rental flat on my own so that is part of the reason why i was going to have a night but yeah. um <laughs> the fact that I, could, I could then take it home that night sink a few hours into it um, go to bed at like four o'clock in the morning, wake up at seven, go to work, and then feel like shit for the rest of the day. But it was good. <laughs> well, we've we've all done that, mate. We've all done that. Yeah, you know, I really, really should go. It's three o'clock. I really should go to bed now. I'll be <laughs> three hours time to go to work. One know, more I'm, mission. One more mission. Yeah, that, that that's it. I've done it. I've done it before. And three hours sleep going to work the next day and falling asleep <laughs> at lunchtime. <laughs> Many years ago now, I just fall asleep at lunch now, lunchtime now because of my age, as opposed to sort of playing games. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, right, I, I mean, we, we are firmly entrenched the PlayStation zone here. Yep. So so you, you, you naturally progress from PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4. Yes. Um, there was kind of a gap, to be honest. Um, so to go okay. off on a, li- a little tangent. Um, By all means. I don't think anyone who has just known me through YouTube is going to know this, but 
um, I'm a massive skateboarder. So, um, so between, <laughs> between between that era of say GTA Five coming out, whenever that was, and um, sort of look maybe two years into the PS4's life cycle, that was probably a period of around five six years. Mm. Didn't really. I I always I always, always had my consoles. Um, just didn't play them as much because of my love of skateboarding. Um, and if I want to get more into it, it's it's not just street skateboarding, it's downhill skateboarding. So um, at the time... That sounds I, dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to, to put it lightly, it's a sport that I fell in love with through basically falling over for the first two years. Um and then that, that first the first time I fell off a skateboard, that was it, mate. I was done. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not getting back on it again. Yeah. I originally got into skateboarding just as a way for me to get from my flat, which I just got to get to work. Um because quite quite a nice way to get to work if you're not far from your work. Mm. Um, it's nice and quick, economical. Um I just discovered that I quite like going fast on skateboards. So <laughs> um found myself getting more and more into that um got into downhill through um a, another f- person who i met in cheltenham who was sort of into it and they had this little facebook page that i joined and he taught me how to sort of well you got to learn how to stop is the main thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would that would be helpful yeah I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah I could probably go fast but i just wouldn't know what to do i would just stand rigid on there and not be able to move left and right and would only be able to stop until I actually hit something. Yeah. So I spent the first two years sort of, it is a, a very difficult sport. I would not recommend it to anyone unless you're sort of one of these people that can fall over and just brush it off um, and never, <laughs> never cry sort of thing. Cause... Yeah. That, that's not going to happen at this end. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I spent spent two two and a half years just falling over, and then I was sort of like my my friend who was obviously a lot better than me who taught me everything I knew. He was he was like, you should you should go try and do this like seriously. So um so I did um started downhill skateboard racing in the UK. Um had a couple of podiums. Um, there's only sort of fifty sixty people who take it seriously in the UK. Um, you literally always have to go to Wales to go to events because they're the only places, it's the only country that's got these roads that are um, suitable for it where you've got very little cars and lots of visibility so you can see cars coming a mile off sort of thing. Mm. Um, and then I think in 20, it was 2015 or 2016, I went to Europe to do racing. Um, really enjoyed that, but it sort of put me in my place because the rest of Pretty much every race I went to, I just got absolutely fucking annihilated by all these <laughs> pros from like America and Brazil, and I was like, "Oh, I'm not actually that good anymore." I came like 160 F out of like 200 people, and I was like, "That's not bad." I was like, "Oh, I'm quite good in the UK, but maybe I should just stick to the UK." So, <laughs> um, but that kind of ended about a year after that, so that's when I sort of got started getting back into gaming because i had a absolutely enormous crash which i had to have two ankle surgeries for um, i was just practicing on a hill in um i think it was either northumberland or cumbria it was just a, a fucking steep hill and i went over a, a pothole a bit wrong i probably shouldn't have even been going over it at that speed but mm. i had a gps watch on and I went over this pothole at 52 miles an hour and my board just left the road. And I had my leathers and my full face on, mm. but I literally thought as I was crashing, like, well, this is it, because I knew there was stone walls at the side of this road. And I thought oh. I'm gonna I thought I'm gonna hit yeah. it or something. But fortunately I well, unfortunately, I landed on my right ankle, which is my back foot, because I but front my left foot is my front foot. Mm. So you more, so it would have been catastrophic if I landed on my left because you mostly balance on your front foot, 
um, with any board support. Um, but yeah, I landed on my ankle really badly, rolled it as far as it'll go, and then um, spent about two years recovering from that. Um, I had two surgeries to put it right. Um, because instead of a full break, it was they had two bits of floating bone fragment floating mm. around, um, which is actually worse than having a full break. Because if you have a full break, you just get metal in there and then take it out when it's done, sort of thing. Um, but as soon as I had my crash, that's sort of when I was like, I was reevaluating in my head: do I do I want to take this? seriously and do i want to keep getting these sort of sorts of injuries if i want to take it to the next level because that's what you need to do yeah the people the people who take it seriously in that sport they're quite comfortable going 70 80 miles an hour and i was like i i feel like i'm gonna die if i go faster than like 55 because before my crash the fastest i've ever been was 55 and that was in czech republic um, at a race and um, that actually felt quite tame to be honest because the roads out there are so much smoother mm. um, but yeah I was like if you want to take this seriously you've got to be prepared to have massive injuries and take years recovering and I'm just like to be honest um, I get more fun out of the small things of skateboarding like skateboarding to work and just going down I still like doing downhill but I go on like more technical hills that are sort of you've got lots of corners in. So yeah, yeah. On a downhill skateboard, you slide to slow down. So when you go around a corner, you basically slide around it like a, kind of like a car drifting around a corner. You're losing speed as you do it. Um, and I enjoy those sort of smaller hills with lots of corners where you're just sliding all the time and you're never really going over like twenty, thirty miles an hour. Um, and the risk is a lot lower then because if you come off, you're going quite slow anyway, and you just sort of land on your knee pads. Yeah, um, I, and yeah, it's, it's a love of mine that, that occupied a lot of time. Mm. But um, yeah, after that sort of reevaluation after my crash, I, I I went back to to gaming obviously, and um, it was actually around the time I met Natasha. So uh, oh. it's a blessing, blessing in disguise. It is really. I mean, that that was a, a hell of an accident to have. I mean, as you said, it could have turned out completely different. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, fair 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 play to you to sort of come to that realization. Don't want to carry on doing this, or especially given the states of the roads we have at the moment. Anyway, I mean, you, you've got plenty of chance to get potholes and stuff. But I, yeah. I, I just, I, I mean, that's such a lucky escape. And, and yeah. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't have a my full face helmet on and b I had um, a custom leather suit on, which is kind mm. of like what motorbike people wear. Um, I had a custom skateboard leather suit, and yeah, without it, I would have probably lost so much skin. Mm. Uh, I mean, but, yeah. you, you think about you know how much damage a car can do at twenty miles an hour. I mean, if you're doing. 50 yeah. odd miles an hour and you've been th thrown into the air or flying off a corner and being thrust into something it, it, it's not going to be a pleasant outcome and no you know, it's, definitely, I mean, it's definitely not a sport that you do for money either like even people who are the best in the world at it they're only just about supporting their living to be able to travel around the world and do it yeah yeah there's this yeah it's, it's, it's i suppose it's not all about the money but um, it's... No, it's definitely something you got to do for fun, and yeah. it definitely started out with something for fun. But then I think I was just taking it a bit too seriously, and that's when accidents mm. happen. But then you think how much money you know Grand Prix drivers are paid. Yeah, and, and, and you know they do they do a similar thing. They're putting their life down every time they sit in that car and get it onto a track. Okay, they're going a lot faster than somebody on the skateboard would do. But even so, it's you know, thought they'd be. Mind you, having said that, I, I, I've not really heard of, of, of that as a sport, so or a pastime. So it, it's it's a new one on me. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not Olympic Olympic skateboarding is quite a new thing, but that's just street skateboarding at the moment. Yeah. Rather rather weirdly, they said that the Olympics actually told like the skateboarding downhill federation that um, they don't think there's enough technicalities skating down a hill for it to be in the Olympics, and I was like. 
That's, that's all they do in the Winter Olympics in skiing, isn't it? I was it's, like, the yeah, sort, it's the same sort of thing. Have you ever watched snowboard racing? Yeah. In the Winter Olympics? It's incredible. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, well, I don't know. Oh, what do they know anyway? What do they know? <laughs> Stupid sports you never heard of in the Olympics, as it is. As it is. Um, right, let's go back to PlayStation 4 then, because uh, yeah. obviously, obviously this is a pivotal sorry, point, point in your life by the sound of it. Yeah, that was a, a massive tangent. Sorry about that. No, mate, don't <laughs> worry about the tangents, honestly. The tangents are great. Like I said, it's it's something that I didn't know about you. Yeah. And a, 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 a sport or a pastime or a... A thing that goes not I didn't know about either. So to me, that's all fascinating, and I'm, I, I know people enjoy the tangents and other stuff. It's, it's learning about you at the same time as well. So yeah, definitely. Don't worry about um, it. Don't worry about it. But anyway, um, obviously, I mentioned that I used to race on my skateboard. I think I think that whole that whole competitive spirit sort of carried into my gaming as well, um, and that that really came to fruition when I got my PS4 and I got um, Dirt Rally 1 on the PS4, which is the next game on my list. Yeah. Um, and that was, um, it was a it was a massive step up. If you've ever played like Dirt 1, 2 or 3 and then you step up to Dirt Rally 1 or 2, you're, you're, you're absolutely suck because you'll be like, the physics are totally different. They're suddenly more, way more realistic. Mm. Um, but I'd been watching Bradley for a number of years, just watching it and thought, oh, it's going to be too expensive for me to sort of consider doing it um, on the computer or gaming sort of thing. Because at the time before Dirt Rally, the only real rally simulator you could get was Richard Burns Rally. Yeah, um, and that was on the PC and PS2, I think, and the Xbox, um, uh, Xbox as well. Yeah, um, but it was sort of more serious. People would do it on PC because you could obviously sort of mod it um, and and put new stages on there and update the cars and things. Um, but yeah, when Dirt Rally One came out on the PS4, that was a massive love for me because. Um, I like a game to be difficult. I don't like it to be easy. Um, mm. And Dirt Rally certainly was very, very difficult. Um, I basically went from zero to very little um, steering wheel slash, um, well, yeah, steering wheel experience yeah. to, to um, going on to this game and trying on the Logitech G29 at the time and thinking, wow, this is going to take me literally years to even get slightly good at. Um, and I think at first I bought a little like um, folding stand for the Logitech G29 um, just so that I could put it away and just sit a desk chair in front of it sort of thing. Um, so it was not taking up too much space as well because the house we were renting at the time wasn't enormous anyway. Mm. Um, and you if you've got a dedicated um, sim rig, you kind of need it to not be portable. <laughs> you need it to be in one place. So it's the same every time you play it. Sort of thing. Uh, I could understand that. Um, and Dirt Rally has, going back to the racing side, it has, um, it's officially licensed by FAA Rallycross. So it has all of the official Rallycross cars on there, um, which are basically... Um, modern rally cars with ever so slightly different specs, but um, you're essentially racing f four cars on a little circuit. It's on dirt mostly, little bits of tarmac, and is pretty much no rules racing, um, which is really, really good fun. Um, if you've ever watched Rally Cross, you have to do something called a joker lap as well. So it's very technical when you take your joker lap. The joker lap is um, one lap in the four lap race that you have to do where it's a slightly longer route of the circuit. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, um, if you are if you start the race and you get a crap start, you just immediately take your joker because you're like, well, I'm behind anyway, there's no point wasting time fighting with the others trying to get past them 
if you go into your joker lap, you've then got clear air, like they talk about in F1, where if you've got clear air, you can really focus on your driving. Whereas if you're fighting to overtake someone, you're losing time. Um, so I love that aspect of racing. Um, and obviously the rally aspect kept me entertained as well. So I think that game has got a lot of depth to it for that reason. The fact that you can do traditional rally where you're listening to the co-driver to drive the, the stage or yeah. you can do four four car racing with pretty much no rules where you're just absolutely hammering cars and bashing <laughs> each other around and, that's uh, my more, that's my sort of thing that's all yeah. like. but yeah i found myself sort of doing a bit of rally and i think oh that's it's getting a bit tiresome now i'll go and play some rally cross to sort of um Desensitise and chill, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, go to some rally cross to, to chill out a bit. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm. I, I think I, I have played a couple of games in the Dirt series, but I think that would have been on certainly PlayStation Three era. Anyway, I'm glad you mentioned it about the, the difficulty level going up when you get to the the, the two games of PlayStation Four because that will put me off buying it for a bit. I'll have to go get dig the ones out on three again and just try and uh, get good at it before I start investing in that one. Cause I do, I sort of do like my driving game. So yeah, I can't say I would recommend it to anyone that doesn't have like a force feedback wheel, to be honest. Oh, um, right, okay. Yeah. It's one of those games you, you can play it with a controller, but it's highly beneficial to have a steering wheel. Um, and Actually, that's quite a common message I get is how do I get into sim racing? And I, I always recommend the, the Logitech because um, if you can get good on the Logitech, then you'll know it's it's worth spending the extra on what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna, when I get all my stuff out the store again, when I get my room sorted out, so I'm going to try and dig that out and yeah, um, see if it still works because it's been a long time since we used it. If you're more into your arcade games, I would highly recommend mm. Wreckfest on the PS4, which is also on PS5 now as well. Okay. Um, Wreckfest is more of an arcade-style racer. You can play it with a steering wheel, but it does play more like a traditional arcade steering wheel game where you've got force feedback, but it's not it's not overly realistic. Um, it's obviously more realistic than... Um, a fully hardcore game, arcade game like Sega Rally, but um, yeah, if you if you just want to play an arcade game on a wheel, Wreckfest is the game to get. It's demolition derby style racing, or um, you can actually just do demolition derbies as well, so you can just ram each other and absolutely take out your anger on ramming someone online. <laughs> 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 I, I'm writing that one down. I, I do tend to make notes on things that might be interesting, so I shall write that one down. That's my definite. Go. It's my definite go-to game when I want to hmm. sort of take out some anger. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's all good. I, 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 that sounds like my sort of thing. So uh, that's good. So that was Dirt Rally. Um, as we're on the PlayStation Four, the, the other two games on your on your Desert Island list are, are from that machine. Yeah, that's um, right. so we'll, we'll tackle those while we. It's been all over. I, I, usual business will be wondering. He's jumping about all over the place, but because we're having such a good conversation about it, um, things are cropping up before the usual structure. So I hope people are following it at home. Um, so um, we've done. So as like I said, the, the games we've done so far on your list were Gallagher, which is the arcade, the cocktail arcade, Micro Machines on the Mega Drive, Dragon Age Origins on the PlayStation Three, and Dirt Rally on the PlayStation Four. Which leaves us the two games left over, and um, games I've heard about. That's yeah. all. I'll, I'll try and do it in chronological. So, um, the next one is The Witcher Three on PS4. Mm -hmm. Very, very well known RPG, and this is again why I'm stressing that I don't like RPG games that have crap combat because The Witcher Three has probably the best combat system of any RPG I've ever played and an incredible story to back it. Um, I always find it absolutely hilarious when I started playing The Witcher 3 it was soon after release I think because 
I saw it advertised somewhere on a forum that was sort of Dragon Age based. Mm. Or friend, friends that played Dragon Age and they were sort of talking about this game. And um, yeah, the, the story of it is incredible. And the, the actual author of the book, The Witcher, was a book series before it became a game. Um, but it was only ever a, a PC game for Witcher 1 and 2. Um, I think I think the second one might have been out on Xbox as well, um, but it wasn't wasn't didn't really take off to be honest. Um, but the third one was absolutely perfect because the graphics had sort of evolved enough to portray what was in the story perfectly. And um, again, it's one of those games where you influence the story through your decisions mm-hmm. um, even more so than. A Dragon Age game independently, not so much collaboratively, but independently, there is more sort of situations that can happen in The Witcher 3. Um, and I love the fact that they kept um, putting more DLCs into The Witcher 3. Okay. So they've got um, two massive DLCs. DLCs generally in other games are not like big things. They'll sort of add a few hours, maybe, and cost you 20 quid sometimes. But these were actually reasonably priced. And they were like playing an entire campaign 20-hour story again if you wanted to do the whole thing, um, which I think is absolutely awesome. The fact that they've basically released a game and then basically doubled the size of it with a DLC, and then again with a second DLC, um I absolutely love that that game for, for that reason. Mm. Um, I believe they've actually got a third DLC coming out um in December on the PS5, um, which is a free upgrade for the PS4 owners, um which I'll be in- incredibly eager to play. Will, will you be getting up at midnight to download that or <laughs> <laughs> don't quite think so with baby coming, but no. Well, we, we, we might be away by then. It's a good, you know, sleepless nights are coming, Dale. So you know, it's a fair <laughs> chance it would be there. Um, yeah, I mean, were were you a fan of the other two games in the series, or is this a fan of all three? This is just the best one of the lot, or I didn't actually play the first two until I'd played the third one. Okay. Um, and then I didn't even really sink sink many hours into first and second on PC um, because they weren't that great, to be honest. And um, I actually preferred sort of watching um, sort of – there were long videos on YouTube about them, but I preferred just, just watching them, mm. um, watching how someone else was playing through them. Um, I don't. I didn't really get a gaming, a proper gaming PC till fairly recently, so that might have been why as well. But but yeah, that 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 game it's on, in its own right. If you just forget that it's a third game and just mm. play it, I can guarantee you, ninety nine percent of people will enjoy it. Okay, that's a good enough recommendation for that. Uh, did you see the TV series? Yeah, I really enjoyed that actually. Um, again, you would have to, if you know the law from the from all of the games, then you would understand TV series perfectly, or equally if you read all of the books. I think there's like six or seven books. Um, then you would understand the Netflix series better. But mm. as as an entertainment factor, if even if you haven't watched, um, even if you haven't played the game, even. Um, like my wife, she actually really enjoyed the TV series, and then as a result, actually, what wanted me to wanted to watch me play The Witcher Three again, um, okay. so that she understood it better. And yeah, we both love the Netflix series, and um, I think there's a second series coming out in December. I think they've not. I think it's, yeah, second series is on. I think the third series has all been green, already been green lit. I'm sure yeah. I heard that the other day. Um, yeah. And it's, it's a series that Claire watched. Claire, she never played The Witcher, as far as I remember, anyway. I don't think I've seen her play it or <laughs> ever played it before. But yeah, she, she watched it. I think she quite enjoyed it. It wasn't not my sort of thing, but uh, um, yeah, interesting that one. 
Yeah, I liked how they sort of kept the... Well, they, for the most part, they kept the main characters the way they were in the games, which mm. is kind of, kind of nice because sometimes you see games that are on TV series and you're just like a completely different... Makes a change, doesn't it? When they, when they, yeah. get, they get it right, they don't try and tinker or mess around with it too much. And, yeah. Um, no, yeah. That's good. It is, it is. Um, so the, the, the final game on, on your Desert Island list... For the, the games we you know your six favourite games here is another PlayStation Four title again a game I know nothing about apart from the fact that I've heard of it. Yeah, so this is a game um, I don't actually have a physical copy of yet, but I needed to get it. Um, I got it on PS Plus. Must have been about a year ago now, and that is Days Gone. So Days Gone is very much a series if you're if you're into The Walking Dead. Then Days oh, Gone. one of those, is it? Days Gone is the game for you um, if you love that series. Um, ah. I do, I do love Walking Dead. Um, my wife enjoys it too. Um, but it's it's got a very in depth story to Days Gone. Um, very different sort of way the story goes to Walking Dead, where it's it's kind of focused around one guy trying to find his wife who lost at the start of the apocalypse. Um, I don't want to spoil it for other people who may not have played it, but um, yeah, he spent a lot of time just trying to find his wife. Um, So it's quite an an emotional story. Mm. Um, And then there's obviously other emotional attachments that happen in that journey where you're trying to find your wife. Um, So you've, so your main character is from a motorcycle gang. It's it's kind of like a if you ever watched Sons of Anarchy, it's kind of like a guy who used to be like in a motorcycle gang like that in America, mm. and then has sort of joined this apocalypse style world where you've got hordes and hordes of zombies everywhere. And uh, yeah, you can basically either play through the story, which is amazing and emotional and incredible in its own right but you can also go off and free roam and really explore this massive land um you do actually unlock more areas as you go through the story but um you don't have to sort of do it all in one go you can just do one mission and unlock a next little bit and then free roam as much as you want and get all the collectibles and stuff um i don't think i'll be even though i've got the platinum trophy on it I haven't even done more than 35% of the hordes. So um, there's obviously massive hordes of zombies in this game. Mm. Um, And that has a very unique style of gameplay to it where you've got to really think about um, how you take out the hordes most effectively because um, it's kind of... even though it's nothing like it, I would compare it to Resident Evil 1 and 2 on the PlayStation 1, where mm. you've got very limited ammo or uh, resources to take out the zombies. And if you if you run out of ammo, that's it. You... Well, that, that's how it would be, though, wouldn't it? Yeah. In, in, in that situation before, we've seen it on the television, that's how they portray it, but that would be the actuality in real life, should that ever happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, the technicality behind taking down these hordes is it's sometimes sometimes easy dependent on the location of the horde the horde actually moves around the map and you've got to actually find it um it, if you see it once it will like stay in your mission list um oh. but it won't actually tell you where it is it'll just give you sort of an area and then you've got to scan that area for it and then that can be really fucking scary because you can be out <laughs> at night and you're looking for this horde and suddenly they all sprint out of a cave at you. And it's yeah. just like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I would be the same as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely terrifies Natasha when she was watching me play that. She just jumped so many times. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I'd be, I'd be jumping with her, I tell you. Just, I, I just don't like that sort of stuff at all. Um, <laughs> but there's... So, so, there's there's a lot of sort of complexity to how you take down the hordes with the fact that a you've got um limited ammo because you've got to find ammo basically 
um, you can you can buy ammo for certain weapons at um, like checkpoints and base camps, basically. But the more sort of advanced stuff for taking down hordes, um, like Molo there's these um, big versions of Molotov cocktails. I can't remember what they call them in the game, but you basically instead of using a uh, beer bottle Molotov, you find these growlers like they use for cider. And you make mm. a massive Molotov out of those, and they can take out. If you if you throw them right into a pile, um, then you can sort of take out like I don't know fifty zombies instead of ten, sort of thing. Nice. And that and that can be massively helpful because the hordes are sort of anywhere between two hundred zombies and six hundred zombies, I'd say. Okay. Um, mm. And there's things like attractors that you've got to build out of parts that you've scavenge from cars you can pick out car alarms from cars and make these things called detractors which basically they're like things you throw that um set off the car alarm in this one place and then zombies sort of hoard around it and make it nice and easy for you to throw um a grenade or these massive molotovs onto um and then, and then that would sort of get rid of the majority but um finding all of these resources was actually quite tricky. You mm. didn't, you, they're not sort of freely available. You had to spend hours looking for some of them. And some days you'd come across a load of useful stuff and some days you just find next to nothing. So yeah. again, that, that, that's how it would be. So I, it's, it's very sort of very realistic from that point of view. Mm. Yeah. It's got a lot of depth to it and I love it for that. I think, I, I think I know Sony might enjoy playing that one. I'm going to have to write yeah. this one down and add it to my list as well. Uh, <laughs> yes, she's also a big fan of The Walk. She was a big fan of The Walking Dead. I think she's gone off it a little bit now. But uh, Yeah. Um, I've always joked because like, she loves watching programs like that about zombie apocalypses and all sorts. And I've always said, in a situation that ever happens, I expect you to be the complete expert on this because <laughs> I've got no idea what's going to happen. You've watched all these programs, you'll know exactly what to do and we'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I doubt I doubt it'll ever happen though, but uh, we, we shall see. Um, <laughs> so, so that, those are all the all the games on your on your desert island list, which is uh, again a lot of modern stuff on there. But we, we, you know, you, you said right at the very start, you know, you are uh, one of the the up and coming generation of people compared to us old buggers who've been around for a long time and get misty eyed about you know Commodore sixty four <laughs> games. So it's uh, yeah, it's it, just the way it's just the way it goes. You generally remember the games you played between sort of 10 and mm. 20 years old the most fondly i'd think yeah are, are you taking these games because they're favorites or are you taking these games because the fact you can get a lot of playability and longevity longevity out of them i think it is the replayability and longevity mm. um and the fact that a lot of these games have got um different ways of playing is going to keep you playing on a desert island sort of thing yeah yeah I, I I would say that I would, I would completely agree with that. Whether I want to be playing Days Gone on a desert island <laughs> or on my own, I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, I might be a mistake. <laughs> it might be, yeah, it might be. But pe people take them all for different. Reasons. To be honest with you, no one ever says, "Oh, they're my favourite games." Well, they don't say that anymore. Now they they tend to say uh, they they think about the scenario. And if you're going to be on Desert Island, and uh, th that's what they want to be pl playing games that are going to. Um, prolong that experience of which we'll get to your your other two games very very shortly which are both pretty much in the same category for differing yeah. reasons um <laughs> let, let, let's return very very briefly to your the remainder of your gaming history because i know um, i can see it in the background now it's in your videos anyway you, you're a playstation 5 owner yeah i was actually quite fortunate to get that i just um put my email into the um carries pc world um sort of email pool and um they basically randomly pick email addresses and then you have to like phone them up within 48 hours and order it. Otherwise you're gone. Sort of thing. Mm. And I was like, God damn, I better get it then. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have that? Was it, was it at launch or just after launch or? Uh, no, I had to wait quite a while actually. Um, I don't think I actually got it till early June. Okay. So it would have been about six, seven months after launch. 
and, and for, for those for those of us who are probably never going to upgrade to PlayStation Five, just give gives a very sort of brief um, reason as, 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 as you know, are there obvious improvements to it on the PlayStation Four? Is it a better machine? Is it something that you would recommend people getting? Um, if there's games that are PS Five actual releases or have been specifically optimized for ps5 then yes but if you're just buying it to play ps4 games to run in ps4 pro mode then no mm. um i'd save you money for now um i i knew that in back in may that wreckfest was coming out on ps5 and playing wreckfest on ps4 as much as it is a good game um when you're playing with more than, I think it's about 10 cars in a race or in a demolition derby, you do sometimes get big frame rate drops. Okay. Um, especially racing, if something's happening, even if you're out front and the AI behind you are having a massive fucking brawl, um, <laughs> it'll just uh, start lagging and then you're just like, what the hell's going on? And then um, I knew that um, Bugbear, who make uh, Wreckfest were releasing a PS5 version in June for f basically free for I think it was um, a ten pound upgrade from the for, for the PS4 owners or it was free on PlayStation Plus um, and I I had it on both so I just got it for free but um, yeah on PS5 it's a massive improvement you can suddenly have twenty four cars in any situation and never have a frame rate drop. Um, which is especially mm. good when I'm using the sim rig because you want it to f you want it to feel like you're there sort of thing, um, and you don't want anything to detract from that driving experience because if you're going around a corner and suddenly the frame rate starts dropping, you're like, well, where's the grip then? Sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, okay, it's one of one of those, but uh, I, I think. I can't, from my point of view, see a reason for me to upgrade, basically, because I don't really play the PlayStation 4 all that much, although that, that's, that's changed. I've probably played in it more in the last couple of months than I have done in the last three years or so. Just one of those those things for me. I still um, think I've got it uh, uh, maybe a little bit too early, to be honest, because there is only that that is PS5 optimised for me at the moment. Um, I obviously play... I do play Dirt Rise 2.0 on it in PS4 mode, um, mm. just so it doesn't drop the frame rate. But um, I, I easily could have waited. Um, I think I would have been more desperate when The Witcher 3 DLC comes out in um, December, when when the Netflix series comes out for season two. That's when the um, new DLC comes out for The Witcher. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that would have been more tempting. So probably one of those. Yeah, you say my have prefer to wait a little bit on that one again that, that's the thing if you buy a machine at launch providing there's a reason to do so and the software that's coming out for it always coming out shortly afterwards is there yeah i suppose that's what it's for really okay yeah. well that, that, that's that's your playstation family as you called it before we came on here um, <laughs> before we get to your last two games i, I know we, we touched this during the, the pre-chat and that there are a couple of systems that you've you've now got that you played on when you were younger or um, we wanted to, to get into your collection, so just give us a, a, a very, very sort of quick synopsis of what you got on those. Yeah, so um, I'll start with the oldest, so that would be the N64. So, my cousin gave me our Mega Drive to me and my brother. Um, he replaced that with an N64 at the time, um, but I used to go around their house and play on their N64. And the game I remember most is Pokemon Stadium, mm. um, just because I enjoyed Pokemon. I think I'd only played it on the Game Boy Color, I think it was, at a friend's house. I never actually owned a Game Boy Color until recently. Um, and I really enjoyed playing Pokemon Silver, I think it was. Um, so I fell in love with Pokemon Stadium on the N64. Um, just because it has the same Pokemon in and um, the same sort of um, uh, weaknesses for different Pokemon and stuff. So if you if you know your Pokemon, then you can sort of do well on Pokemon Stadium. 
And obviously it's a multiplayer game, which is another factor that really sells it. The fact that you can um, pick Pokemon to fight against your friend. And yeah, I just, I got my mind blown by the first time I saw the N64 because in my mind at the time, a cartridge game couldn't be that good at 3D sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other system you got was? So that is the GameCube, which mm. uh, um, was obviously around the PlayStation 2 era. And a friend of mine from school had one. Um, we, I used to go around his and play Super Smash Bros. And um, I think it was Super Mario Soccer, I think it's called, or something like uh, that. Mario Strikers, or nothing. Yeah, Mario Strikers, yeah. Yeah. Um, we used to really enjoy playing those multiplayer again. There's a theme with Nintendo, there's a lot of multiplayer stuff that I love. Yeah, um, that's right. And that's a console I, I bought recently because I discovered that there was a plug and play mod called the GC Loader, which basically means you can take out the original disk drive and put in this SD card um, reader and PCP, PCB even. Um, and then play GameCube ROMs off an SD card. And the GameCube, um, you plug this GC loader into the original port that the ribbon cable was for f- for the disk drive. Mm-hmm. So as far as the GameCube motherboard is concerned, it is the disk drive. Um, and I really like those kind of mods where you don't have to modify the console in any way, really. That sounds really good. Yeah. Technically, it is a mod, but I don't have to modify the case. I could put the disk drive back in if I really wanted to, and there's no harm done, sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, um, no, it's it's good when you can do things like that, and as you said, not modify it as such, and and do do as change as little as aesthetically as you as you need to to be able to get something like that done. Yeah, and there's also the factor that obviously. Um, discs from that era are not are not as well made as Blu-rays are now. Um, they're not going to last forever. Um, I think most DVD discs are predicted to last less than 35 years. Mm. Um, so if you don't do something about preservation in 10 years' time, it might come around to bite you, sort of thing. That is true. And, and if you think the DVD has been around probably since 1999, 2000, we've maybe got about another... 10 years ten, or so before yeah, that 10, 15 started. years you'll see a lot of um just starting to go wrong sort of thing unless they've been sort of seriously well looked after mm. like a lot of my stuff doesn't get played so it's sort of my dvds it's yeah yeah sitting sit the cases out of the way some of them probably never been watched actually yeah Which, does, that, does that mean they're going to get 60 years life out of them <clears throat> um probably not <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. You can't you can't say it until it happens. No, that's very true. It's the same with anything tech based. You don't you can predict how long it's going to last. Whether it lasts that long is another another factor. Mm, another factor, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that concludes your your gaming history. And now we're on to the fun part. I always quit the fun part. Um, <laughs> the last the last two games we asked you to take your desert island. Yeah. Um, the one game which we get to at the end, which is the one that you don't particularly like, it's always fascinating to hear people's reasons as to why they don't like it. But we have the second chance game, which is an opportunity to give a game a second go for whatever reason for which you will advise us now. And I'm pretty sure this has cropped up. I'm sure someone's mentioned this game before, but not on this particular format. Right. So. so- so that game is Minecraft on PC specifically. Um, I didn't. I'm not one of these people that's just got into Minecraft when Microsoft bought it. I was actually um, around for when Minecraft was in alpha. So mm. I my Minecraft account is something like number 109 in the world. So when I bought my Minecraft account for about a pound back in my sixth form days, which must have been about 10 years ago now, um, yeah, it cost me pound fifty, and I was an alpha tester technically for Minecraft. Okay. Um, 
and they gave you such a cheap price because you are essentially testing this brand new game. And um, in my sixth form days, I was kind of flunking sixth form, to be honest. Um, it was absolutely crazy. It's going to go and going to go off on a tangent now, but um, <laughs> in my in my sixth form, I I obviously knew I wanted to get into computers. I always had a passion for them, so I chose computing and IT as two of out of my three subjects, and I think film was like the other one, mm. um, just because it was kind of nerdy as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but um, the computing at um, a level was stupid. It was something like ten percent computer theory and ninety percent coding. And I just my brain does not work well when it comes to coding things, mm. um, as I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. It's something you either you either click with or you don't. And my brain definitely did not click with coding at all. So completely failed it. I knew I was going to fail it um a few months into the two years mm. so um and it i also failed which is quite funny when you think about it because i, I failed say, yeah, where you are now could the, <laughs> the yeah. of doing so that, yeah. I, I failed it as well just because it was in my eyes it wasn't it it was doing fucking powerpoints <laughs> oh right yeah oh well that's that's something completely different isn't it and it didn't interest me at all so Basically, I skipped a lot of those lessons and just was in the sixth form common room. And in my spare time between playing Minecraft, I would literally just fix people's laptops. Hmm. And okay. that was actually quite a passion of mine was fixing computers. So it could be anything from fixing a bit of Windows software to completely rebuilding the software or taking the computer apart and replacing bits. Mm. Um, like the inverters for screens because you've got these angry teenagers that were throwing their laptops at each other and, <laughs> and then screens would go funny and they'd be like, why is my screen gone funny? I'm like, well, yeah, you threw yeah. it across the room, didn't you? Yeah, the, 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 the cause and effect, I think, <laughs> was the best way to describe it, yeah. So, yeah, I spent a lot, a lot of my time in sixth form repairing laptops and um, little did I know that would stand me in good stead for the future. Um mm because um, I got to the end of sixth form, having failed absolutely everything apart from film, which I got a s barely scraped to pass and I got a C, I think. Um, and basically all the teachers said, oh, well, there's no future for you. You're not going to uni with those grades sort of thing. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then my, gran then my granddad found uh, an apprenticeship scheme for, um, it was a sponsored Microsoft apprenticeship for uh fixing computers basically software mm. and hardware so that really interests me it was a year-long apprenticeship where i only got paid 90 quid a week um and that was basically for full-time so full-time classroom for nine months and then full-time in a workplace for three months at 90 quid a week as well mm. um, I was just living at my parents and getting through that, getting loads of qualifications. And that was the first time in my life where I felt like I was actually good at something. Oh, right. uh, okay. Yeah. Because I'd spent all that time in sixth form fixing those computers, playing Minecraft, and didn't really realize it at the time. But that was building my knowledge massively on all the different types of hardware and how software works mm. and um and then yeah it gets to the point where anyone can just give you a laptop and i can fix it really quickly because i fix so many sort of thing okay all right well we, we had a we good one's place on he, he, he fixed his stuff and all sorts and that was uh you know i, yeah. I was fascinated when people can do things like that because stuff i can't do yeah which is which is pretty much most things i'm always interested to you know, hear about how people do things and, and you know, a great respect for people who can do something like that, who can pick a screwdriver up at the right end, you know, like yeah. myself, and just, just grabs all the stuff and like, yeah. I definitely, it in. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed Craig's one. He was uh, definitely yeah. someone who's sort of quite similar sort of um, aspirations to myself. 
Mm. Um, I work in mainly software support now, so um, I've actually just moved teams at work, so I mainly look after like email now and Skype and things like that. The okay. back end, the back end servers are not um, not really hardware anymore, but occasionally I will be putting them together. But um, <laughs> back to Minecraft. So. Minecraft, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, that, that that's in, that's interesting. That's relevant because it fits in when you were doing mod, Minecraft testing anyway, wasn't it? So yeah. So obviously, some days I'd be inundated with fixing people's laptops or whatever, and some days I would just like, well, no point going to this lesson because I know I'm going to fail it anyway. Mm. Um, so just played Minecraft with a couple of friends in sixth form who had discovered it. And um one of the one of the people one of my friends who discovered it first was actually one of the first ten people to ever play Minecraft. Um and he got me involved just by sort of we he, he knew I was a techie as well. Um and I knew obviously knew he was a techie because we were actually both in the same computing class, but he was a a whiz and sort of he 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 was he was in sixth form common room for the opposite reason he was too good at computing <laughs> oh right yeah you, know, you always you always had people like that didn't you you always knew yeah. somebody who didn't need to go to all the lessons like you did because they knew everything and they would be absolutely fine so yeah so uh yeah i spent a lot of time with him his name was uh george and yeah um yeah, fond memories of him sitting next to me and like he was trying to get me into minecraft and i was like looking at it at first i was like oh it's just a blocky 3d shitty game and i was mm. like the graphics are crap and he's like oh just look past the graphics so that you can see there's all this depth and i can make this and i can make that and i'm like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and i found that really really interesting the fact that it has actually got an education educational aspect to Minecraft. The fact you can make circuit boards in Minecraft with redstone and things like that, um, and you can obviously just make like little land parties and things, which were really really fun. Mm. Um, I don't I don't think land that land parties feature actually came until beta, which was probably a few months after I got into it, but. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed being an alpha tester for that. And every time the game crashed, you sort of had to write down what was happening and send it off to Mojang, who owned it at the time, and um, they would sort of fix it. And it was really cool to know that me and my friends were sort of a part of part of the beginning of Minecraft, pretty much. Well, I mean, that's, that's something to be proud of, isn't it? And, yeah. Um, I, I've, I've got limited experience in Minecraft. I've... I've, I've very lucky to find a copy dirt cheap. I say dirt cheap, incredibly cheap. And I thought, well, you know, what? I'll buy it and find out what it's all about. And then I, I did sit down, and I've said this before, I sat down and played it for about an hour. And, and all I seemed to, to succeed in doing was digging the holes, which was <laughs> fine, but I just couldn't really see. Yeah. And this, yeah, is, why really... it's just, this is why it's a second chance game for me, because since. Since my sixth form days, I haven't really played it much, to be honest. And there's been so much added to it since Microsoft bought it out from Mojang mm. that um, I've just completely lost touch of it, to be honest. But I know for a fact there is um, infinite depth to that game, um, which is why I choose to take it on the desert island as my <laughs> second chance game. I, I think it... it... It's going to be a game I would consider myself doing exactly the same thing. Not because it's a second chance for me, because as I've played it for an hour, that's, that's hardly giving it a second chance. But because you're there, you know, I've got time to sit down. and I've probably got about five or six games I could put in this slot quite easily myself that would benefit me spending more time on them, not because they're bad games. It's just that I would have that time to learn how to play them properly. Yeah. And you know, actually, what what the hell am I meant to be doing anyway? Or with other games, I'm not going to reveal anything. Because I may do this myself at one point, so I'll get somebody else to ask me the questions. Um, which would be quite interesting to see how that turns out. But uh, to you know, learn how to play a game properly, understand the concept of it, the moves, the the configurations, and and what you're meant to be doing. And this is an ideal game. 
to take to a desert island, whether it's a second chance game or whether it's a you know favourite game, because the amount of hours you could put into it, I'd, I'd say hundreds. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. yeah, you need. There's a lot to learn. Um, even when I was testing it in alpha and beta, there was still a lot being added all the time to it. And I dread to think how much I've missed in those in these last like nine years or so. Hmm. Oh, you're time to find out, isn't it? Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's it's a good choice, and those sort of games crop up on on the, these this all the time, really. So, I one I can probably agree with you on there, but yeah. whether whether it, whether it would make my list or not, I don't know. Um. Okay, then. So so. We, we've now hit the, hit the final part, the, the, the fun bit at the very end, is to find out what you've picked and why. There's the game we ask you to take as the game that you don't particularly like. Yeah. Uh, and this game has cropped up all over. If it pop, cropped up in the very, very first episode with good old Griffo back in early summer of last year. Um, yeah. And I can't remember where about it, where about. I think it was one of his favourite games. <laughs> But, I'm, about, I'm about to slate it, I'm afraid. You're about to slate it, but you wouldn't be the first person, certainly. I don't think you'll be the last. <laughs> right, so that game is Skyrim. Not any particular platform. It's just a crap game on every platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to do a bit better than that. So, as I've mentioned previously in this episode, for, for me, an RPG has to have really, really good combat systems to make it... Um, well, worth playing in my eyes. Mm. Um, and Skyrim just has absolutely shite combat. It's, it, oh, I just, I can't get my head around how shit it is. It's, um, yeah, for, for its time, it should be a lot better than it is. If you look at games like The Witcher and you look at Dragon Age, um, Inquisition especially, and um, Dragon's Dogma, the combat can be incredible. And for it to be so sort of basic is a, a killer for me. Mm. I, I tried, I bought it because my brother had it, um, played it for an hour and a half. And I was like, why is this combat so shit? It's, this is a modern, massive RPG game. It should have good combat. Mm. Um, the story was like, all right, I guess. But the combat, it was really, it really pissed me off because you'd like fire, you'd fire an arrow or swing a sword and it was pretty much one or two animations for each. Um, and there wasn't really much more to it. And I, I can't understand the humor between that bloody, I took an arrow in the fucking knee and therefore I can't be a warrior anymore because I just don't, I don't get that humor. Um, like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever I mean if you've played games like Dragon Age and The Witcher and Dragon's Dogma you'll know that the stories can be incredible and the combats can be incredible so um, I think I think Skyrim was made popular mainly, mainly by its advertising to be honest and it being made by such a big studio mm. um and it was generally played by, in my eyes, it was played by people who maybe didn't know about these other great RPGs on the PS3 and 4. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's my opinion, but I could be right, I could be wrong. So. Yeah. Well, uh, look, people will always argue the choice, won't they? It's one of the great things about it. What your choice is, is not, not one of your favourites. Other people um, absolutely love it. I, I mean, I've never played it, so I, I, I can't. I can't really comment. I've got a copy of it somewhere. I think everybody's got a copy of it. I think if you if you have if you have more than one game in your gaming collection, you have to have a copy of that just to <laughs> the sake of it. I mean, it's, it's it's so so cheap and easy to pick up. But so I can't I can't really add anything to that. But there will be other people out there who will agree with you, and there will be other people now there who will be burning effigies of you on the streets and saying, <laughs> you know, "What's he talking about? This combat system, the best combat system ever." <laughs> Even his Dragon Age, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's, it's going to be that—it's going to be that sort of thing, isn't it? Really, I mean, it's, it, yeah. you, 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 you hate it for a particular reason. Um, well, that's that's kind of why it is on the list, though, because if it, even though I hate it, 
if I had to take a hated game, it would be that because um, I I know there is a lot to it. People who mm. friend I've got friends who have completed it a hundred percent, and they've told me how many hours they have to sink into it. It's like three hundred plus hours. Right. So I know it has a lot of depth, and that would keep me occupied on a desert island, but. I wouldn't be very happy about it. <laughs> no, you would. No, you wouldn't. No, that, that's very. That's very true. Um, just, just very quickly before we finish, what was there? Was there anything that ran it close in terms of you know? Would you pick? Was there another game you might have picked instead of that one, or was that the clear favourite for your choice of the? Um, yeah, it's kind of a clear favourite. Um, one that came maybe maybe a bit closer was. Um, when Resident Evil moved on to um, the Wii, um, mm. I actually really enjoyed um, playing Resident Evil 1 and 2 at my my friend's house on uh, PlayStation 1 all those years ago. Um, it was mainly, for me, like the sound and the controls. So I, I really like how the old horror games like Resident Evil 1 they can go from completely silent um, to massive monster jumping out of you sort of thing. Yeah. And um, I think there's something you, you kind of take for granted nowadays in modern gaming, but with modern gaming, you kind of get some sort of ambient noise whenever you're playing anything, some sort of music or footsteps or something mm. to sort of, tell you that something's happening in the game but in resident evil one and two you didn't really get that um which made it even more scary um and then when i tried to get into resident evil on the wii uh, was it number four um, four was the one yeah 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 i just i was like this isn't resident evil it's completely different it's just changed the whole thing it's um it's not scary it's not as scary in that sense anymore as not it doesn't go from silent to scare. It goes from scary background noise to scary monster, pretty much. Mm. I mean. Again, that, that, that's an interesting perspective on it because a lot of people would, would disagree with that. They would say that, I mean, I mean, I've heard people say that this is one of the best games on the Wii and some people have said possibly up until, the, the I think, Resident Evil 2 remake, it's probably one of the best Resident Evil games. Better work better on the Wii than it did on the PlayStation Two. So that's that's an interesting point there. Yeah, I think I think sound matters a lot in games. To be honest, I think mm. you can really you can really ruin a game with how different the sound is compared to their predecessors, sort of thing. Okay. Well, that, that's that's that's, that's an, an interesting topic to finish on and and i'd love to hear what other people think about and indeed anything else that you mentioned during the course of this so we've now reached the end of your desert island journey awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> how was it for you yeah it's good um still getting used to this style of thing this is the first sort of social podcast live stream whatever you want to call it i've i've mm. done so it's a pleasure to be on um mm. but yeah, I've actually got um, a couple of other live streams coming up in the next month or two, which um, you can keep an eye on my Instagram for. Um, I'm not sure I can mention them right here, right now, but um, but they'll be very soon after this video comes out. Mm. And um, really looking forward to getting more involved in the retro community. Um, I'd like to sort of vary my content a bit more, so it's not just me blabbering on about tech and retro games it's me talking to other passionate people and um getting more sort of diverse conversations going yeah no it, it, that's what it's all about uh, to, to integrate yourself and when, when you feel the time is right you know people, people some people jump straight in and some people take a little bit of time and and the, the, the more you get into it the more comfortable you feel with doing it the more chances you'll have of doing something like this i mean I, it's been absolutely great to have you on and there's been you know, one thing I always say about doing these is, is to, to learn more about the person behind the YouTube channel. I mean, I know we've met in real life a couple of times, which is fair enough, but there's stuff here that you've told me today, which I, I've not heard you talk about before or mention. And, you know, we, we do the odd WhatsApp message and 
here and there. But so I, I've learned a fair bit tonight, um, which is good. So I always like that and to know more about people. And uh, I hope people listening have, have learned a fair bit about you. And for, as I said right at the very start, I'll put a link in the description below to Dale's channel, particularly that one video with the uh, the uh, uh, grid rig setup, and you can not grid rig the dirt rig setup, and you can talk you through that. And you can see what it's all about. It's it's absolutely fascinating to watch. And now it's been a really really interesting chat. And again, like everybody else who's done this, and I know you said you've listened to maybe all of them or most of them. Once people start talking about something, it's very passionate, and you can see the 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 thrill of it, the joy of it, the you know the, the love that come out. So that comes across when everybody does these things, and uh, then you go off the tangents, and that goes with it as well. So it's it's, it's all good fun. I, you know, it's been absolutely fascinating. It's really really enjoyed it, and uh, thank really you very great. much for doing it. I'm really grateful as well to the whole retro community. Probably some people who are listening to this. Um, the amount of um, positive feedback I've had in the past six months has kind of overwhelmed me to be honest mm. i think i think i looked at my youtube channel and it said five weeks ago you made a video saying well thank you for 100 subscribers yeah. and um i think it was last week i had now got to 200 um so in the space of four and a half months i got my first hundred and then in the space of five weeks i got my next 100 which is <laughs> And and they say that that it, it, I mean, you bet two fifty ish now I think like something like two fifty uh, two ten now. Oh, is it two ten? I'll have to be a bit higher yeah. than that. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself there. <laughs> but but no, it, it's good. I, I mean, I always say to my example, it, it took me eight months to get the fifty. So the yeah. fact you you know you you've got to two hundred in you know six, you know about six months time. I think it was April. You said it was it started April. Yeah. I've had all so these about, about six months. Yeah. Yeah, I've had all these ideas brewing in my head. What am I going to do? when um, this games room is all set up because um, when we sort of reserved to buy our first house back in June last year, I was like, oh, it's a free bedroom. Oh, I can uh, make a games room. In there. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, I've been planning it. Mm. And I've been like, oh, I've been writing down all these video ideas on my phone notepad and just like, mm. yeah, I'm going to really enjoy filming that. And sure enough, I have. So um, yeah. well. We, we, we're enjoying you know watching your channel grow and i hope people who like i said haven't heard about you before go across and have a look at what you do and, and those of us who have uh found you um so early the youtube run and so like taking you on the roll wing but giving you some encouragement and um, a little bit of promotion here and there will carry on to support you uh and also i think on behalf of everybody listening i'd like to wish you and natasha the very best with the upcoming arrival of your your first child as well we all hope um, you know, we will be hearing all about that. Yeah, I can't wait to uh, introduce him to uh, YouTube at some point. <laughs> I, I, I know you're incredibly excited about it, and and it's just absolutely brilliant. So um, we wish you all the very best with that as well. So cheers for that. That's no problem. That has been Daily Retro, aka Dale, talking to me, the Retro Bear, on this episode of Desert Island Games. If you have enjoyed listening to that, there are other episodes in the archive on my channel. Uh, new episodes go up every Saturday in the early hours of the morning, but it doesn't mean you have to listen to it then. You can listen to it any time during the week. It's always going to be there. You can download it to listen however you want to do it, etc. There will be another guest this time next week. I know who it is. I haven't spoken to him yet, but um, I'm looking forward to that. Somebody I've known for quite some time who sort of burst onto the YouTube scene last year and uh, garnered a quick following. So that will be an interesting one to talk about then. Once again, Dale, thank you so much indeed for your, your time and agreeing to do this. It's been a fabulous listen, and um, hopefully we can do something again very, very soon. Uh, thanks again, Russ. And, yeah, look forward to doing more stuff on the live streams in the future. That'd be great. Yep, and we look forward to seeing you uh, get involved in those as well. Right, that's it then. So um, that's all said and done. This is the Retro Bear saying thank you very much indeed for listening to this week's episode of Desert Island Games. And I'll be talking to you again, same time, same place next week. But on behalf, behalf of Daily, uh, Daily Retro, this is the Retro Bear saying do take care and we'll talk to you.